this uh, special meeting of the Neshoba Regional School Committee to order. Um, and we are meeting via Zoom. And so at this point is, is um, our flag guy here? No? No, we don't see him. Okay, and my flag is flying out in front of the house. <laughs> So um, if you will just say the Pledge of Allegiance virtually, if that's okay. All right, if you don't mind. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, yay Todd, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And thanks, Todd, you saved the day. <laughs> so I had some, uh, just a couple of um, uh, requests for citizens comments. So I will read them. One is from Elise Roden. She lives in Stowe. She wants to thank the teachers, administration and school committee for continued efforts to create a safe, effective learning environment for the fall. Please know your work is appreciated. My incoming kindergartner and second graders both wear masks all day at camp. I have seen kids as young as three successfully wear masks to attend camp. I fully support requiring all students to wear masks regardless of grade level. Under the hybrid model, especially under option three, split week non-rotating, I am concerned about the amount of time that special needs students will get receiving in-person instruction from their academic teachers and with their peers versus receiving related ser services such as therapy. There are children who are pulled out of their classroom for multiple hours of therapy each week. And if they're only at school in person for two days each week, that will have significant effect upon how much time they'll get learning in person with their academic teachers and peers. I hope that is being considered as plans are formulated for the fall and that efforts are being made to ameliorate that problem. Example, perhaps special education students in one cohort could visit the school during their remote learning days to receive therapy. And then the next um, um, citizen's comment is from Jonathan and Jessica Grassis. Um, we would like to begin by saying we realize these are confusing and difficult times for not only parents, but administrators and teachers. As parents, my husband and I have continuously advocated for our children in order to receive appropriate services within the Neshoba School District. We have obvious concerns about the health and safety of our children during these times. With that said, we are also extremely concerned about their education. We are residents of Lancaster with two children on IEPs. Son is currently finishing up a 40 day placement in early risers in Bolton. Our daughter will be in kindergarten at Mary Rowlandson Elementary. Our son was placed in early risers program last year, three weeks before quarantine. He has a disability that impacts his ability to function within the typical classroom setting without, a significant, without significant supports. He thrived during those three short weeks. Before that time, he had been able to successfully complete first grade academic work Within a regular education setting, as Mary Rollinson did not have the necessary supports he required. For this reason, he is slated to repeat first grade at Florence Sawyer under the supervision of Early Risers program. It would be truly detrimental for another year to pass without him re receiving social emotional services, academic supports, and integration into the regular classroom setting that are designated as on his IEP. Our daughter who is beginning kindergarten has been receiving speech services since her first year in integrated preschool. This past year, she also received ABA services that were implemented by the lead teacher under the supervision of the Neshoba's VCBA. Due to her speech delay, family history, and suspected auditory processing difficulties, she had a greater risk of reading difficulties if not provided with appropriate supports in kindergarten to build necessary foundational schools this is a child that needs to be physically in the classroom receiving necessary services daily. We understand these are difficult times. We have just one family with children on IEPs who are scared and anxious about lack of progression and possible regression of our children. This is not just about academics, but also social and emotional well-being for students who, reserves, who receive services 
specifically for these reasons. Although true of all students, they are especially at risk if not receiving appropriate time and services within the school setting, which could result in lifelong academic and social difficulties. Although attempts were made to provide uh, remote learning opportunities and supports for our children during the spring shutdown, they are not able to work in this mode without significant support from trained professionals. Their disabilities require differentiated instruction that is impossible to provide remotely, meaning they were at a significant disadvantage compared to a typical child. We are asking that we think of all children and their individual learning needs when making decisions about the upcoming year. Thank you for your time and commitment to our children and our schools. So that's it for citizens' comments. So um, we have a one item agenda with multiple parts. And so at this point, um, I will turn the meeting over to Brooke. We're going to follow the format that we followed last week. Um, I will, um, everyone will make their presentations. School committee members, please um, wait until the end for your questions and everyone will have an opportunity to ask them. So it's probably helpful as, as we're going along, you jot down um, your question and, uh, and the category. So from your um, agenda, you can see that we're gonna be covering athletics, uh, SPED, extended learning, and then Brooke will have a, um, a general update. Okay, any questions before we begin? Seeing none, Brooke, I'm gonna turn it Great. over to you. Thank you. So I, I wanna start by thanking everyone who was involved in our uh, forums, our question forums last night. We had uh, about 132 people when it was the largest in Bolton and about 51 uh, that were in, in Lancaster. So that was terrific. And we had a number of school committee members on, um, a number of our task force uh, folks, uh, people that were working on the steering committees or the, the different groups were also there. So very, very appreciative of that. And, and um, Todd and I will just talk a little bit more about that uh, when it comes to that, that particular agenda item. But just all, I think all way around, just very, very su successful. So we're looking forward to tomorrow's. Tomorrow we do um, the Stoke, we have one for the Stoke community and we have a separate one for the high school. So we're looking forward to those too. Um, just a couple of quick thoughts before we go into each of these. As I take a look at them, and I know that we're, Tanya and Joan and Raina are all going to present, but um, a couple of quick thoughts about each of them and just in general. And you know, I think uh, some uh, one of our Bolton parents had given me, I just thought such, such sage advice on our steering committee and said really stress that the answers that you're giving right now could be different answers tomorrow or different answers and the way that the DESE has been giving out its guidance by midnight tonight, because very often we will get our guidance at about 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, I, I think to um, extend a school year is a, such a perfect example. We received guidance on the Friday night before the Monday start of our extended school year and changes had to be made. And it's very frustrating for us. So when we're giving answers right now, they're the answers that we know as we sit here tonight. So for example, you know, I know that Tanya is gonna do a bit of an update, but I also know that there's a huge meeting coming up, I think next week. I'm not sure Tanya, whether you'll um, allude to that meeting or not, but there's a, a big meeting coming up. And um, we were told today that we'll probably get additional guidance in about two weeks time with regards to update for athletics. So I'm kind of anxious to see because Tanya has um, connections in different areas than we do. So I'm kind of anxious to hear what she has to say. The pupil um, personnel component for SPED uh, is another one of those areas that we just continue to have um, a, dare I say, a drip drip of guidance that comes out. So it's not like, here's all of your guidance for this one area. It's not working like that. We'll get a little piece of guidance and then maybe in three or five days or sometimes 14 days, we'll get another little hit of guidance on that same thing. And SPED this summer, I think was one of those perfect examples where we just got a little bit of guidance and then a little bit later, we got another little bit of guidance and then a little bit later, we get another little bit and it, it just continued to kind of drip, drip out. It makes it very difficult for us um, and it creates, you know, um, Steve, Colin, Colin and I were having this discussion this afternoon. 
for us as leaders, you like to have the right answers all the time and the concrete answers that you can take to the bank and say, this is what we know. Right now, it's this is what we know right now, but it could change. And so, uh, you know, I think that uh, we're being told, and, and again, Joan will probably, probably speak to this, but we're being told that there will be ongoing guidance that continues to come out of DESE regarding SPED. So she, she is committed to whatever guidance comes out and has very, in her case particularly, very little wiggle room to work outside of that guidance. Um, so with regards to, to RENA uh, and the extended day program, it is our hope that we can try to run some type of semblance of extended day, but I want to be clear that as we sit here tonight, we're still not sure if we're going to be able to do that. So she's going to present the work that's been done to date, but I want to be very clear that decisions have yet to be made and we have yet to receive firm guidance on this from the state in this area. So you're hearing tonight from three areas that we've received very little guidance from at this point in time. So um, of, of all of our areas, I think that we, you know, we've got uh, certainly more guidance on facilities. Um, the, the financial component, I would tell you, we have almost nothing on that. You know, even today, Pat, the questions were asked in the commissioner meeting and we're told that there's nothing available to us right now. So that's almost the ex exact opposite where there's like zero <laughs> being put out, you know. But when it comes to these three areas, these, these three areas tonight, very little guidance and we're being told to expect guidance in upcoming weeks. So, you know, I know that parents want answers. We want answers, it's not just our parents. Leadership wants answers. And we continue to be frustrated because we're trying to plan. And I think extended school year was such a great example where I don't know how many drafts, Joan, you talked through with me before you landed where I think it was four or five drafts of, of fully laid out plans before we landed where we did. The same holds true, and I want to put this onto the table again this evening. As a district, Neshoba Regional School District is aiming for a hybrid model. That is, that is our aim. That is our goal. As we sit here tonight in late July, a lot can happen between now and September 16th. We don't know, and we have been told over and over again and again today in our meeting with the commissioner that we need to be prepared to pivot on a dime. So I just, I feel like I need to say that every meeting because we just honestly don't know. And, and we actually, Todd and I just received an email minutes before we went on air tonight that reinforced, be prepared to pivot. So right now we are continuing to push forward with a hybrid model, that's what our planning is. And what we continue to say to everyone is at some point in time, whether we start with the year with a hybrid or not, at some point in time this year, we will be in a hybrid model. So the planning will always be good, good thoughtful planning anyway that we'll utilize. It is our hope that we start with a hybrid model, but there are no guarantees, just like that, that Bolton parents that there are no guarantees with the answers that you're giving either right now because they could still change. So I just wanted to kind of do that tee up. So I think, uh, Tanya, if we can start with you and it, let's just see where you go. And if, I, if, you, if you're missing anything that I happen to know, I'll make sure that I put that in at the end. Okay, awesome, thank you. So thank you all for having me tonight. Um, I am gonna echo what Superintendent Clunchy just said is the information I share will change numerous times in the next few weeks. So I'm gonna share what I have right now, but I'm waiting for more information to come. So the first thing is I wanna go over an MIA update. And the MIA is the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, which is our state's governing body. So back in June, the MIA established a COVID-19 task force that has been working on different proposals for sports since June. Last week, this COVID task force presented to the MIA Board of Directors, and the Board of Directors voted and approved the following recommendations as of right now. 
The first one is that they're gonna, the state will comply with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Educations and the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs guidelines. The second thing is that the fall sports will have a delayed start and will not begin prior to September 14th. Now I could already see that date changing with the information we the schools received with schools being able to open on the September 16th date, um, adding those 10 days of PD for staff. And the third thing they voted on was to suspend the handshake protocol for sports, which just makes sense at this point in time. So right now, um, the entire state is waiting for DESE and EEA to come out and release their guidelines for the fall season, which they told us will be early <coughs> August. So I think in the next two weeks, they're going to come out and let us know if we can have a fall season. If we do have a fall season, what sports we can have, can we not have, and give us more guidance with what it's gonna look like this year. Now, once those guidelines come out, the MIA COVID-19 task force currently has three different proposals that they're ready to share with the board of directors once those guidelines have been announced. Those proposals, um, I know they, they're out there a little bit right now, but it could be a regular fall season, it could be a model that New York is following, which could be having all three seasons run through January through June. Or there is also a third model that is breaking the year up into five seasons and has each season, the sports starting with what can happen at the time. So for example, early in September, we could potentially have cross country and golf, but maybe not contact sports. So right now, those are the three proposals that are out there. But again, everything is waiting on the DESE and EEA guidelines that should be coming out in the next couple of weeks. So that's where we are at like a state level. Um, we also part of the Midwatch League. And in the Midwatch League, I am the league secretary and also on the task force. And right now, um, there's about 15 ADs on this task force that have been meeting. And we're discussing what sports gonna look like, what changes we're gonna make. We had our first meeting this week and next week we're going to really focus on changing our schedules because right now with the delayed start, we're not going to, be able to play 18 to 20 games this fall if the fall season looks normal. Um, we're looking at breaking up our league into regional pods. So the games that we play would be in schools that are in a close proximity of us. So those bus rides or whatever it looks like are we're only traveling, you know, 15, 20 minutes compared to an hour to some schools. And then we're also working on um, our COVID-19 protocols for athletics in general. And this would be for coaches, students. We also have our athletic trainers working on these protocols, safety protocols for us. And we have a doctor from UMass that is working with our trainers as well. So we're trying to bring all this together to make sure that we're all um, have the correct protocols and health and safety of all of our student athletes and coaches as our number one priority. The last thing I wanna to mention too is um, we also have a group of ADs, it's the Central Mass Athletic Directors Association, and I'm going into my second year as president of this association. And right now, we're just gathering information from schools within Central Mass on what their plans are for having sports, depending on the school model. If it's remote, hybrid, or a full return, what are their ideas around having all their sports? Is it a varsity only? Is it sub-varsity? What do they think about middle school? Um, are they looking at a shortened schedule or a full schedule? So we're just collecting data just so we can share with one another so we know what's going on within Central Mass as well. And as all of this is changing, I've been trying to keep all of our families um, updated on the status of what's going on when I receive that information. Right now, we still have fall registration open, assuming we'll have fall sports at some point. I've asked um, families to register their students, but not to pay user fees yet just because we don't want it to be making 200 plus refunds if there is no season like we did in the spring, or we may have to change it up not knowing what our seasons are gonna look like. So that's pretty much it at this point. Like I said, this could all change when I get off this meeting tonight and we get more information, but I do think in the next two weeks, we should have more information um, to guide us in a better direction. So I, Tanya, thank you so much. And I just wanna, uh just fill in one little piece here from the commissioner today. So you're absolutely right. I, I understand that they're waiting for the DESE is a bit of a linchpin in, in this too. Um, and my understanding is that there's a large group of um, 
stakeholders that are connecting. I think within the next week and a half, I think they're convening um, under Karen Polito. I believe she's leading this particular group. And I believe that they are, uh, they are bringing in um, medical professionals as well to help guide. So they're being, I think, uh, really, really thoughtful in uh, how to move forward with this because it's just, it's brought with a lot of complexities, quite frankly. So, uh, you know, just even, you know, hearing uh, Tanya, as you were talking about the busing and I'm knowing what we are having to do with the busing right now. And I'm thinking even busing alone to games will be substantially different than anything we've ever done before. So there are, there are so many layers to all of this. So um, I'm anxious to see what comes out of that meeting or that group of meetings that these individuals have. It does sound like it's gonna be a very large group of folks that are meeting. So uh, again, I concur with Tanya. I think that you'll, you'll see something probably in about two weeks time, if not even a little bit later than that. So, and the only reason I say, say that is because a lot of times we're told that we'll get something in a week or two weeks and it ends up being a little bit later than that. So. Um, I think sometime mid mid August is probably when we hear something. So thanks, Tanya. I appreciate that. You're welcome. So uh, hang tight, uh, Tanya, because there I'm sure there'll be questions at the very end. So let's no go problem. to Joan uh, DeAngelis at this point in time. Now I know, <coughs> excuse me, Joan, that we've kind of submitted a number of questions to you, and we're hoping that you know where you're able to provide answers you will just kind of fit them into the presentation. We were not asking you to do a question and answer like we've done do, been doing in the forums, but we know that you have uh, have seen all of the questions. And um, some, of the, some of the questions that came in, like there were a couple that came in late tonight. And I think that those questions will just be naturally, some of those, those were kind of easier questions to respond to. I think some of those will be answered as Joan speaks tonight. So Joan, let's turn this over, uh, over to you then. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. I have lots of information, so bear with me uh, through the programming, uh, through the uh, each of the bullet points. Um, I wanted to start off by talking about virtual meetings. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about in your review meetings and concerns around that. Um, when we were initially shut down for the first three weeks, as I was looking at the trajectory of where we were, I was starting to make plans of you know, how will we do virtual meetings um, if we in fact have to go in that direction? So everything was on pause at that point. Um, Desi had paused all of those things. So I got my team chairs together. Um, we learned how to do virtual sign-ins for meetings. They went through trainings. Uh, we came up with a protocol in the event that we were closed longer. Um, and then we did some practice meetings um, during that April vacation week. And lo and behold, as you know, we were closed for extended closed for even longer. And at that point, um, I just unleashed and said, okay, we need to have all these annual review meetings because the we're likely going to be closed for the year. So we developed a calendar. We really worked hours on hours to um, share staff. You know, we have common staff that work with students. We developed one calendar. Um, and we um, proudly um, conducted probably more than 200 virtual um, IEP meetings. All the annual um, review meetings were held and we were able to, for kids we had completed testing, we were able to review reevaluation results as well. Um, I keep, couldn't be proud enough of my team and we have finally gotten all those documents out. I wanna say about a week ago, those, documents from the meetings, every meeting results in a document, obviously, and revisions. So all the documents have been sent to families and about 12 parents requested for us to meet in the fall. So we don't really have a huge backlog of in review meetings. So I feel like that's really good news for us. Um, in terms of initial and reevaluation testing, um, we were paused given the need to conduct in-person assessment. So most evals can't simply be done remotely. And if evaluators deviate from the evaluation protocols by conducting a remote eval, it puts into question the validity of test results. And it's really important that we as a district maintain the integrity of our evaluations. 
So I have spent um, the last two weeks working on devising a plan to complete evaluations, or at least if parents are willing to bring some students in to do some of those in August. Um, we have about 15 evaluators in the district that said that they would be willing to come in and assist with the backlog. So we've posted for those positions. Um, and I'm working on a process to get those done. And for the evaluations we can get done, we're obviously going to start with the latest, um, the ones that are, you know, we're due. And then we're going to work backwards. Um, and when we come back in the fall, I've really devised a kind of all hands on deck plan to complete evaluation. So I'll just give you a little example of what I'm thinking. So if we have 12 evals that were uh, need to be done, psychological evals in Stowe, I will deploy our five school psychologists. They'll all do two evaluations to help each other during that first week. Um, the second week, they'll head to Bolton. Um, and then the third week, they'll head to Lancaster. So I will do that also with speech and language, occupational therapy. So I feel like I have a comprehensive plan to make up all the evaluations that we've missed. Um, I have a list of all the testing. And so we're hoping to start doing evaluations as long as we have the appropriate equipment for the evaluators for safety for students and faculty um, to begin that on or about the, um, August 10th. So that's my goal. Um, extended school year, um, as uh, Brooke has said, um, you know, Steve Grant and I have worked um, tirelessly to open extended school year um, with the ever changing guidance that we have received. Um, we made three plans. We had plan A, plan B and plan C and lo and behold, we got more guidance and ended up in plan D. Um, sent out a 130 ESY letters and then lo and behold, two days later, we had more guidance. So um, we were just so committed to having our highest need students come into district. We just kept charging ahead and said, we're going to keep going and we're going to find a way to just make this work. So we had to make a fourth revision, um, which included um, we hired a second nurse. So we have um, students now that are in five different locations across the district. We didn't want to bring everybody to, we usually do all our programming in Lancaster because we have air conditioning and that's nice. Um, but now we have programming at MRE at um, Luther Burbank. Um, we have um, programming at Emerson, the Emerson building, and we have program, two programs at the high school. So we have nurses that are covering Bolton, um, Emerson, and the high school, and we have a nurse that's at MRE and Burbank um, to really just be able to have somebody available in the event that we had a student that became ill or a staff member. So that's worked really well for us. Um, you know, Desi provided us very specific guidelines about um, who should be coming in for extended school year services. And it was really our most complex um, learners that probably didn't benefit from remote opportunities as much as other students. Um, so we worked and reviewed every student's ESY services and made determination of who was going to be coming in for in-person services. So we offered in, I'm gonna give you some data so that you have that. We offered in-person services to 73 students. 60 students have attended in person, four have selected remote and 11 declined services. And then we offered remote services for 57 students for academic speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy and counseling and about a half of those have accessed services this summer. Um, our model uh, landed in a hybrid model because we were prescribed the number of people that could be in a room at one time. So um, in terms of the number of staff and students, and we really, um, for district-based students that are in programs and our programs across the district, those are the students that were a priority. We did a two-day um, in-person and a two-day remote. So students come in on a Monday they have in-person services, they go home with remote activities on the second day, they come back the third day, and then they go home with um, remote activities on the fourth day. Um, 
so prior to um, ESY, uh, Lisa Gilbicki worked very closely with us to make sure we had all the PPE that we needed, uh, gloves, masks, um, goggles, um, gowns, um, hand sanitizer from facilities, um, cleaning materials. We made sure everything was distributed. Steve came in on a, the Sunday before and distributed all the PPE materials to each one of the classrooms. Uh, Lisa provided specific training around safety precautions um, and facilities constantly collaborated with us because I then spread the program throughout the district. Uh, principals were fantastic about opening their buildings and allowing a different modality this year, so I can't thank them enough as well. Um, this summer, um, the majority of the parents have transported students. I had very, very little guidance around trans summer transportation. There was no plan. So I um, offered to parents, I asked them to please transport. Um, and if they had a concern that they could reach out to me directly. Um, we've offered mileage reimbursement to the parents because we're responsible for that transportation. Um, so when we sent out our letters, we sent out the mileage reimbursement forms to make sure we could um, reimburse parents for transporting. Um, there were th uh, three parents that reached out that had really difficulty with transportation and I was able to secure transportation for them. Um, but that was for three students transportation. I will tell you that was no easy task because I, they, they were coming out with protocols at the very last minute. So I asked parents, have a plan the first week because I'm not sure I'm going to have transportation in place. Um, but we were able to get the students in and I think that's the most important um, piece of this is that we are committed to having students in person. Our faculty were committed to coming back to the students. Um, and, and I can't say enough about ESY. I went in the first week and walked the programs and the students were happy and excited to be in school and I had a lump in my throat. I uh, had to step out for a minute because it had been months since I had seen students and to see them so happy and engaged and being with their teachers and their friends, even though they were socially distanced was just um, a moment that I probably will never forget in my life. Um, you know, our primary focus for ESY this summer has been rebuilding routines. So there's consistent routines providing social emotional support, social opportunities for students. And then we are weaving in obviously teaching and learning through theme-based units. Um, parents have expressed a great amount of gratitude that we opened ESY. A lot of districts you know, stayed remote and I think they were just thankful that we pushed ahead and forged ahead. Um, do I think they would wish for more? Absolutely. But with the number of people in one room guidelines for this summer, I could not do more than what we um, were prescribed. Um, I haven't had any expressed concerns from parents of having their students in person during ESY. Um, they're happy for the structure, support, and routine for their students. Um, so. Uh, we are now um, at the end of week four. Tomorrow will be the end of week four. The first week of ESY was really training for teachers and preparing the classroom. So the students have been back with us for three weeks. Um, they are wearing masks. I'm very proud of them. That's not easiest for our most complex learners. Um, our teachers have been amazing. With students who aren't able to wear masks, I had a teacher find out that a student you know, loved Disney and got him a Mickey Mouse mask. We had a group of students that were making tie-dye masks, so they got to pick the colors they wanted on their masks. Um, some of our youngest preschool learners, the teachers are working on um, getting them to tolerate wearing a mask um, so a little bit at a time. So, you know, I'm really proud of our staff because this is very new for them and they are doing their absolute very best to support our students and are so committed to having them in this summer. Um, big news, our transitions program has moved to the Emerson building. Um, we have identified a space and we are very excited about that. So I was at the building with the students. They invited me for lunch today. Um, and they are very excited about having a post-secondary educational place to learn. Um, 
They have painted inspirational rocks that will go on the opening of their program. Um, they have planned a welcome mural to go on the outside of their door and they're making um, decisions this summer about how they will set up that adult space. Um, so uh, they love the Monday through Friday schedule instead of being on an eight day rotating schedule because they say to me, I call them my adult students and they are and they say so like everyone else and adults we're on the Monday to Friday schedule. So they're really excited about that. Um, they love being together, even though they know they need to be socially distanced. This is some of their feedback today. They said they miss their friends and they like being in person the most. Um, one of the students told me, I want to be back to normal and be in school every day, see my friends. I want to work at the work sites and I can't wait to play sports again. So this type of feedback from the students makes me recognize that despite the, the challenges we face with reopening ESY, given the constantly changing guidance, it was well worth the effort. And they are the, I tell them because they're the oldest, they're the voice for the students in the program. So I'm really um, so proud of them. And I can't wait, um, I'm hoping at some point we can have a grand opening so you can actually come to the transitions program and see what they've designed in terms of the mural in the classroom setting. So I'm gonna shift a little bit and talk a little bit about fall planning. And I don't have all the answers like Brooke said because the advice comes out differently. And every time I make a plan, I seem to be shifting what I originally have planned. So um, Jesse put out on July 9th an 18 page guidance document for special education. Um, I'm just going to give you a few of the highlights. They have basically told us that regardless of whatever the district selects, whether it's a hybrid model or a remote model, DESE has asked districts to provide our youngest learners, our preschoolers, and those students with significant and complex needs um, be prioritized for receiving as much in-person instruction as possible. So they have told us that um, we are expected to provide FAPE consistent, you know, with the need to protect both the health and safety of students with disabilities and faculty providing education and instruction to these Excuse students. Excuse me, Joan, if you yeah. could define FAPE for everybody. Oh, I'm sorry, free and appropriate public education. Thank you. My apologies. Yep. Um, Jesse has defined the criteria for high needs students. Um, and they're saying that even if the district is in a hybrid or remote model, they, we should maintain every effort to make, um, bring students in-person instruction for those students they consider high needs. Mm -hmm. um, so as with ESY, I've had this very methodical way to approach this. Um, we uh, printed all the service delivery grids of all the students. I have met with, um, which is 600. Um, I have met with each principal individually to really talk about the needs of students. So we Joan, I just want to go back to the 600 to make sure because you work. said it so quickly. You're talking 600 students. 600 special education students. Right. Thank yeah. you. I just want to make sure that that's clear to everybody that yes. that's the number of students that we're talking about. Pre-K 12? Pre-K through 22. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's an important distinction. It's okay. So yeah. we looked at all those service delivery grids and, you know, to define that <coughs> gave us the definition for high needs and we're applying that based on those service delivery grids. So obviously students in our um, programs would be considered, you know, students with high needs and then students who have significant amount of instructional support outside the regular ed classroom that requires specifically designed instruction and related services would considered to be in that um, pool as uh, students of high needs. They've also talked about students who are homeless in foster care, um, cannot access remote learning because of their disability, and then duly identified students who might be ELs, uh, English language learners, and maybe students with disabilities. So that's kind of how they've defined the high needs categories. Um, so we have looked at all of those students and we're in the process of um, kind of tiering, you know, you know, what are our tier one students, students that are in our programs that really require um, specifically in design instruction for a large 
majority of the day, and then the tier two with students are those kids with high academic needs that have a lot of instructionalized, uh, specialized instruction outside of general education. And then we're thinking about those students that might be in tier three that even if we're in a hybrid model, we likely can provide the services on their IEP. So um, again, a shout out to my colleagues, my principals who spent a lot of time with me going through um, all of the grids with me and having really meaningful conversations so we can make good decisions for students about who might need to come in more than um, two days a week. So uh, in addition to our in-district, I have to also think about our students who are out of district. And I have um, a lot of concerns about our students that are out of district because um, many of the schools have yet to reopen and they did not reopen for ESY and I have not gotten a reopening plan for those students. Um, a few opened this summer, maybe four on a limited basis, um, but many remained um, in remote instruction. So I have been working with Ann Nealon, who's our out of district coordinator to determine next steps for students who are who might still be receiving remote services during the fall um, because I'm concerned, you know, those programs, you know, in terms of classroom sizes, if you go to some of those buildings, it's very small. So I guess I'm wondering how much instruction they're gonna be able to provide and how many students are they going to be able to bring back? So that's a really complex situation that we're in right now that I am monitoring very closely and they, are, they have to adhere to guidance as well. So I'm sure they're having um, difficulty. And then transportation obviously for out of district students is something else that um, I need to be thinking about as well. Um, for our, you know, and I, until I know whether those programs are, are opening or not, I'm not, I haven't sent um, a survey to those parents for out of district um, students yet because I don't have the reopening plan. I only know on a very limited basis who is opening in the fall. Um, we did this week survey our in-district parents, so students who have specialized transportation on their IEP or they're in an, um, they're in a program where they may live in one town, but attend a program in another town. So we provide transportation. I have surveyed all of those families. Um, so about 60 surveys came back and in two days. I'm happy to say we've gotten 40 responses. Um, the survey closes in two days because we want to start ordering transportation and communicating with Assabet Valley Collaborative and VN Pool about who will be requiring transportation and getting that in place soon. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about preschool um, because um, um, I spent a really a lot of time thinking about our youngest learners and prioritizing them. Um, I had developed a comprehensive uh, plan for our inclusive pre-K um, that I thought would really meet students' needs. And then last Thursday, um, the plan was put on hold because Desi um, indicated they were going to give specific guidance for inclusive preschools. So my plan A for our inclusive preschools right now is on hold and I'm sure I'll be headed to plan B soon. Um, and I have to wait for whatever that guidance is. So I just want you to know I have a plan. I have plan A. Um, which is probably really plan B, you know, plan A for me is business as usual. Plan B is how do we alter that plan? So I am gonna keep forging ahead with making plans and then I adapt the plan based on the guidance that I get because I, I don't think sitting and waiting is a good idea um, ever. So I don't, I don't sit and wait. Like ESY, a lot of districts were like, it's too late for us to plan ESY. Well, I stopped planning ESY in December and I just continued to say, we need to have a plan. So we're gonna stick with plan A as business as usual. And as we get guidance, we're gonna adapt. So I ended up with ESY at plan D. I sent out 130 letters and lo and behold, two days later, I got new guidance. So um, I had to make a few adaptations, but I was still able to open you know, with only a one week delay. So I had a little bit of time to make those adaptations that they were expecting, but um, it's, it's been challenging. 
um, really has challenged me to think out of the box for all of our um, students with special needs, but I am their advocate and I need to make sure they get what they need. So one week delay. So I had a little bit of time to make those adaptations that they were expecting, but. Um, um, so I know I have a list of questions that was provided to me and I don't, I, I guess I could answer a few of those questions I haven't answered in the presentation. Um, I know parents want to know a lot about remote learning. Um, obviously, uh, special ed and teaching and learning will be working together and that's a work in progress if a parent suggests um, requests that their child remain on remote learning you know, we'll be working on the remote learning academy with teaching and learning. Um, I think I've answered questions about um, uh, some of the questions um, about evaluations were asked, you know, the ones that were in process. I have to really rely on the evaluator's judgment about what happens if a student was in an evaluation process um, and then next steps. So, um, the data that was collected probably is valid at the time in March. Yes, students might regress and evaluators may use different tools to assess other areas to really get at um, progress or, you know, areas of concern. Um, so there were some questions about, you know, the hybrid model, two-day model, very clearly um, in-person services for our highest needs will be um, more than um, if we're at a, whatever we decide on hybrid, if it's two days on and two days of remote, we're going to look to bring our high need students back more than that. But, um, but we want to be really crystal clear that there are really clear criteria for that. I think uh, Joni right. did a really nice job in articulating that tonight, but I, I think that really needs to be emphasized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, yeah, we can't, we can't do it for everyone, but the complex right. needers in the criteria that I talked about. Um, is really what we do. Um, so I, I'm happy to answer other questions that you might have. I think parents asked about like clear masks for teachers. Um, we've ordered those things because obviously speech and language is going to be kind of tough if you can't, if you're working on a tarculation and you can't see you know, your lips, your teeth, your tongue to make sounds. So I have um, ordered like the district has many of those masks to provide those for our, you know, our students, um, teachers and faculty and related service providers. Um, Joan, if I can just speak to that too, I think I mm -hmm. may have mentioned this before, and if I did, I apologize, but we've been struggling to find those types of masks that are comfortable enough to wear all day, because a lot of those, just because you see that it's a clear face mask doesn't mean it's comfortable. And so, you know, Rob and, and Lisa have been doing trials with a lot of these different masks to try to find one that we're hoping is the mo most comfortable. I think, Joan, one of the questions that I, I think is not on your list, but I know that you and I have talked about, and, and maybe you can just make a general comment about this, mm -hmm. is just as we look at the five-day schedule versus the six-day or the eight-day, and you know, the, one of the questions that has continued to come up was the, the notion of will the IEPs have to, you know, dramatically change as a result of that. So can you just maybe offer a, a thought or two on that? again? Sure. Desi has said to us that we are not to amend. We are to write an IEP based on our cycle and not to do amendments on service provision. So okay. whether we're on a five-day cycle or a six-day cycle, we will not be making changes to the service delivery grids. And I want to point out again that so many of our districts across the state are going to five-day cycles. Not 100% of them, I understand that, but most, many, most are. And I, I think right now, so many of us are so glad that we've done that because it's brought a sense of uniformity to our districts and uh, a level of consistency as we're working through a lot of these things. So those of us that have made the, the move to the five day are very, very pleased with the fact that we've managed to do that. And we, we feel that we're already re reaping benefits. I'm not talking for the SPED part of um, our world. I'm talking about just in, in, in general. Um, I think, Joan, the other thing I want to just put out there is I, I know that I've said, you know, and I said this last night a couple of times, but we, I really, and Joan, you and I have had this conversation. We really see that um, special education right now is almost running a, a parallel program to um, the hybrid or the remote or the uh, whatever model it is 
that the, the district at large is taking. And then you'll see the, the special education component kind of drop in and fit into that. But they're, they really are almost running a parallel model um, to us right now. It, it, it completely independent from the, the work that we're doing, but integrating into that work. And um, John, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but I know that you and I have talked about that. So um, I don't know if you I can. think that Desi has really been very prescriptive in terms of their expectations. I think that if the district decides on a hybrid model, that special ed is probably going to be bringing in kids more frequently than the hybrid model based on the defined criteria of preschool students or students with complex needs. So I want to be really clear that not all of our students will be in a hybrid. They will be coming in more frequently. So there's a perfect example of even though we're running one program, you will see special education almost run a parallel program that inserts itself into ours. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joan, is there anything else from you right now? I, I think that some of the questions that have come up, you know, around um, the remote learning pieces, if we are actually in remote, or if the governor makes the decision to close us down, then what happens to services? And, you know, we've talked about synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities, but, you know, I worry always about confidentiality. So some parents want virtual services, you know, if we're going to provide something in a small group, um, virtually, you know, we have to really think about confidentiality and asking parents to sign waivers if they want their students to participate in services. So I'm certainly very respectful of people's privacy. I think it's come up both ways. Like I want services either way and other parents saying, how are you going to maintain my child's confidentiality? So, um, and Joan, you and I have both received, um, okay. correspondence from parents on both of those mm -hmm. spectrums from, wanting to be involved to absolutely not. So I would just want the school committee to know that it's it's quite polarized in, in terms of, so one size fits all is not going to work uh, with this. So that's why I would agree with Joan, we, we need to be incredibly thoughtful in how we proceed in that area. Okay. Joan, anything else from you right now? I think that's a lot of information. So okay. I hope that's enough information, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer anything. Well, else. we'll hold the questions till the end. Right. And um, we'll, we'll hear from Raina, I guess, next, Brooke, if that's right. who's on, yeah. So Raina, if you're able to to jump on and just touch base, um, and then I, I'll go No, on. folks, um, I'm frozen, not literally, but on the screen, <laughs> for some reason, my screen stopped, but I just want to, assure you I'm not surfing, okay? I am, I, I'm here, um, and if it bothers you, I can always come back in, but uh, my voice will hopefully communicate my thoughts so you can kind of picture my ideas and my recommendations. First, I just wanna say I'm happy to join folks this evening. It's very sultry, so hopefully everyone's keeping cool. Um, hearing Tanya and Joan, I heard their comments. Um, I too echo the importance of recognizing that it's a fluid situation. Um, obviously, the hope would be for some kind of in-person program. So I'm gonna be uh, couching many of my comments with that um, as the wish, but it, we know that may change. Um, throughout the summer, I fielded many questions, mostly from parents um, and families. And I will say that it was so interesting to see the influx and the types of questions. Overall, parents have been incredibly patient, hopeful, and understanding. Uh, we have, you know, there's the wish that we are in person, but there's also the understanding that that may need to change. Um, if we operate in person this fall on whatever level, our emphasis will continue to be on social emotional learning as it has been in the past. Um, we are, you know, we don't function as an academic center, but rather we certainly enhance academics where we can. And we would like to operate in the least restrictive restrictive environment possible with as much time spent outside where it would be the safest for the children with frequent family input. And similar to students in Jones program, we'll also need to build different and new routines. Many of our children in our program, you know, this might be their second, third, fourth, fifth year because we operate as a K through five program. And for them, you know, we're very, we have very specific procedures, how they enter, where they put their bags, where they have their snack, when they go outside. So we, there's gonna be a lot of, I'll say, training and reinforcement um, and no matter how we come back. 
So as you know, our program is all about kids having fun, um, hanging out together, learning from each other, collaborating, problem solving. So for that reason, our program is gonna be very different, would be significantly different. Um, I will tell you that at the beginning of the pandemic, I reached out to um, Patricia Sinclair. She's the director of the Child Development Center at the Perkins School right in Lan Lancaster. They were a mandated center that remained open during the pandemic. And I just listened to her. She just painted a, vi a visceral picture of the safety measures, which were very strict, the cleansing methods, the hygiene um, with their little ones. And they have even younger than Kay. Uh, which gave me certainly an insight into what we might face. I've also been talking um, really throughout the summer to different summer camp leaders and rec department programs. Since our program shares you know, common challenges in many ways, um, some, I'm not gonna say many, but I say more than half of the summer programs are still running with reduced numbers and smaller groups. Um, there are different activities they are doing. In fact, I just talked to someone today from Upton. Um, they changed their programming around such that the kind of activities like archery, they can do very easily. I share that with you because, you know, we don't need to have our kids standing by themselves necessarily doing uh, cartwheel. I mean, standing doing um, jumping jacks. There's, there's activities they could do socially distant. I wanted to give you a quick snapshot of this year's registration so that we can appreciate you know, what, what we need to do to uh, organize activities and potential learning and enrichment um, environments. So as you can see from the chart, um, last year, and I won't go through every number, but I have all the numbers if anyone wants them. So in Stowe, we have a 25% reduction in numbers. As you may know, Stowe has always been, or has since I've been on board, our largest site. Um, I wanna make sure you know that when, we, when you see those numbers of children for this year, 123 in Stowe, that doesn't represent 123 kids every day because it varies by the day that the family needed the, um, or was hoping for the uh, care. In Bolton, we went up slightly, 3%. Lancaster was our biggest drop at 37%. Um, so that's always been our, our smallest site regardless. <laughs> We opened up our registration May 1st. We had about 80% um, of our numbers already filled by the end of uh, May, believe it or not, which was pretty fast. It was faster than last year. And we kept it open until July 1. We did not extend the opening. And we did that very thoughtfully. We didn't want to obviously over, I don't like to say sell because we really don't sell, we offer. We didn't want to um, disappoint families who perhaps we could have taken, but knowing that we'd have to have a, a smaller program. Okay, so that brings us to that. Um, if we do go hybrid and we have a common remote day, I do want to put out there that we could certainly still run EL on a limited basis with a limited number of students. We haven't gotten to that point yet, so I hesitate to say how many, um, but our numbers, you know, once we know what model, assuming that we do go hybrid, then we're gonna to have to shuffle the cards completely all over to rematch and realign students with the given days that their hybrid model indicates. I wanted to spend just a little time on what I, for, what I envision for enrichment activities and tech, how technology could fit in. We know that kids, when they come to our program, first of all, they're starving. I'll just tell you that even though they've eaten Maybe it depends. Some of them have eaten at 1030 in the morning, but they're starving <laughs> and they're also tired. So, but we want to give them activities that make them feel part of a family. They look at, and they really do. Many of them look at extended learning as their second family. So I wanted to just highlight the staff responsibilities so that there was some sense of uh, both comfort, but also reality as to what we can do. The staff, as you probably know, our staff are trained in CPR. Um, they're very hygiene oriented. And I'm not suggesting by any means that our teachers in the classroom are not, but our staff, they're used to cleaning tables and materials and games. They have to because, it, because of the nature of what we offer. Um, the other thing is that they are able to offer, we will allow them to offer um, ind individual and independent arts and crafts for the students. 
but what we, what I envision is that the students would be given um, their own large baggie with their name on it with specific number of supplies. Um, and that is something I know that um, I believe, Joan, you had actually, I think, shared that with me and others, that that's something that you, that you have done. Um, it will require purchasing, but we're not gonna talk about those specifics, but there's a way to offer enjoyable crafts without necessarily having one table with everything. Um, I also see having, you know, students can certainly play some independent card games. They will be able to build structures. Our kids love building structures. I mean, love it. Lego and other things. They would not be able to do that with other kids. They would need to do independent play and we'd have to pre-assign it, you know, to kids on a rotating basis. Outside games such as basketball and football with emphasis on drills so that it wasn't a group game could also be done and we'd have to wash the items after each use. Um, we would do similar to what Joan has um, set up as a protocol with a wash bin, um, with hot soapy water, a rinse bin and a dry bin. Um, our staff, and I say this lovingly, you know, they, that's what they do. I mean, this won't be new to them because we're constantly <laughs> doing a lot of cleanup. Um, board games would not be available. I wanna be clear about that. Um, but there are plenty of games that my staff and I have brainstormed that we could play that would allow kids to socially, emotionally interact. I don't wanna go through all of them, but everything from Simon Says, Hula Hoops, Pickle, Badminton, drawing on a large mural, there's ways we could offer some enrichment. Um, technology, at each of our sites, with the exception of Center School, all of our sites have five Chromebooks and either five Kindles or five iPads. Center School does not because we've always used the computer lab, which our students love, but um, in talking with Ross, that would not be um, something feasible because of the cleaning required. So we could potentially uh, enhance the children's enjoyment by ordering more Chrome pads. And again, I know these are budget considerations, but I just thought I'd share that. Um, other things that our staff would be prepared to do and would make sure to do is we're gonna to have to offer regular mask, break, mask breaks to our students um, because they're doing things that are active. Um, they're gonna to need to wash their hands and use hand sanitizers often. They will not be able to share any food whatsoever. Something that our kids in extended learning often do, and I know this isn't done in regular school, but they like to swap clothes, try on each other's headbands, jewelry. <laughs> That's because they're sharing. That's a good thing, but not in this environment. So again, we would have to teach them new, new protocols. Uh, we'll certainly monitor children for any sort of illness. We always offer a peanut free table. It should be noted that the extended learning program, we do not have a nurse on staff, um, which requires our staff. And we're very mindful of when any child ever to tells us that they're not feeling well. And believe me, we know, we, we bring them aside, we have them rest in an area that's away from the other kids and we call the parents. But I do wanna make sure that we all are aware that we don't have a nurse on staff. In terms of external resources, and um, as you probably know, um, a lot of our program, much of what I've been excited about and have shared with the community is bringing outside resource, resources in like martial arts, tennis, STEM, et cetera. We could still potentially do that. Um, the programs I've spoken to who have been continuing their efforts over the summer, they have done that um, with kids being six feet apart um, successfully. The, other, the programs have also offered Zoom. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that in terms of where our students inside would be doing crafts would be at the long cafeteria tables, we can fit approximately five to six students at each table where they're staggered. They're not right across from each other. So that gives us about five to six kids. The round tables would be four to five children. Um, I can envision that we could certainly offer, have different speakers and presenters come into our groups where they're, they're seated appropriately apart. We've had a lot of fun with that in the past. We could certainly do that again with music uh, presentations or my, my famous yo-yo guy who kept the kids so entranced that you would have thought that he, he was like from Mars, okay? He was just, and they believe me, 
listen to every word. They were laughing. Food and snack will, will also be an area of concern. Um, I do think that our kids have it very clear in their mind. They do not share snacks. Obviously, we have to be very careful with that. I think I've mentioned in the past that our student to staff ratio, we maintain a one to 10 with kindies one to 12. I envision that we would need to reduce it to more like one to eight because of having to be more vigilant and careful with our students. Um, I really think that being very um, careful observers of kids is gonna be incredibly important. We can't put them in hula hoops and tell them not to move, but the movement would have to be thoughtful and restricted. Something that I think we really wanna pay attention to, and I, I would like to offer this as something to enhance the academic environment, is that I think we can assume that some of our students will have regressed you know, over the past three to six months and talking to mm. many families, the, um, oops, I'm still on, yeah. Uh, they've been concerned about their children not necessarily doing as well with online or remote for any number of reasons. Um, I can envision our extended learning staff doing some to, you know, tutorial kind of work with the kids in a, a more intentional manner, even though we offer homework help. I think also it would be wonderful to consider having more high school students as part of our, as part of that mission. Um, in terms of administrative and logistics, rather than bill our families yearly, at, which we've done in the past for ease of billing, uh, because we're in such a fluid environment, I would recommend that we bill families monthly, um, which would reduce administra administrative time spent making schedule changes because we know that's gonna be more likely to happen. Um, so that's a big picture and a small picture. And probably there's nuances that I could address, but I know I've taken up a fair amount of time. Um, and I'm certainly hoping that we can bring our kids back because I'm very, very concerned as our families are with that social emotional piece. But we need to do what's right for the families and the community. Great, Thank thanks for I appreciate that. Um, so with that, then I think um, we'll kind of turn it over uh, back to Kathy and let's see if there are questions for, uh, for any, uh, any of our presenters tonight, Tanya, Joan, or Raina. Kathy, you're muted. Okay. Um, Brooke, you're gonna be doing a general update. So if folks have questions, if we could just um, have them relate to um, athletics, SPED, or extended learning, and then Brooke can give mm -hmm. us her update. So, um, bum, 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 bum. Amy, Amy, do you have any questions? Uh, unmute. There we go. Any questions, Amy? Yes. I okay, can you why don't up? you start? Yeah, I've got a lot of questions. Um, um, I guess I participated in the uh, community forum for Bolton, um, the FSS task force this afternoon, um, and have tried to incorporate a lot of questions into the frequently asked documents, frequently asked questions document. And a lot of them had to do with uh, the SPED piece. Um, I was wondering if Joan could um, just expand a little bit on, on her answer to the six-day cycle versus transitioning to a five-day cycle, because I don't really understand how that would work. <clears throat> I have more questions, too. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Sure. So what I would say to you is typically we put so much time in a six day cycle. Mm -hmm. So I, I imagine that if we're looking at minutes per week, that's how we'll be calculating the service provision is based on a five day schedule instead of a six day schedule. So the same number of minutes per week would be delivered in five days as they would have been in six. Or is it, it pro I mean, I, I no. No. It, it doesn't work like that. No. I'm so confused. I, I, I'm sorry. It's, it is, you know what? It is confusing because yeah. each of the programs are on a different cycle. So the preschool is on a five day cycle, elementary and middle is on a six day cycle, and the high school is on an eight day schedule. Yeah. So, so after all, five day schedule. 
I'm sorry. Now they will all be on a five day schedule. Right. right? So, you know, obviously we're going to do our best to um, have equivalent minutes that would be on a six day schedule and base it on a five day schedule, if that makes sense. So we'll have to, you know, calculate the difference of the minute on a six day schedule versus a five day schedule. Okay. I think, I think that, that makes sense to me. Um, the virtual IP, IEP meetings, I have heard from some people that they didn't get a meeting. And I know you mentioned that you had done over 200 meetings. Were there families who are still waiting to get those done? Is that part of the backlog you were talking about? So we, as, as far as I know, we don't have a backlog. We did 250 virtual meetings, but some parents opted to have a meeting in the fall when the testing could be completed for students. So if there are people that are saying they didn't have a meeting, I would like to hear from them because we literally, I had a report run from EastBed. There were about 12 parents and I matched up from EastBed to the parents that requested to have meetings in the fall. If they asked to have an additional meeting, um, that might happen in the fall because, you know, there was only so many meeting spaces that we could have. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, the, Kathy, you asked that our questions be related to athletics. Yes, just the three things we've heard from so far, and then Brooke is going to give us a general update, and then we can ask additional questions. So, Anything related to athletics, SPED, or extended learning? I guess my, my only other question related to SPED is, um, you know, as I was listening to the presentation and to Brooke's comment about how it's kind of a parallel program, um, it seems to have a lot of its own um, prescriptive guidance from DEC that makes it difficult to be part of the more general discussion. And I'm wondering how we can address all of those more detailed questions that I have seen come in from parents and, and teachers um, on how services would, are really gonna be, how we're, how we're gonna be able to make it work with a hybrid model. Um, I guess I, my personal feeling is it, it might deserve its own opportunity for parents to ask Joan mm -hmm. questions. So I think that there'll be opportunities. Um, you know, we, we can probably, you know, look into something with CPAC, doing something in a partnership with CPAC or something like that, because you're right, the questions are very different than the general, um, the, the general question. nights like last night so you're, you're right it's it, we'll have to look a little differently i also want to make sure that there's enough guidance out there that there are enough answers to the questions and that's where it leaves us in a we feel that we're in a bad place mm -hmm. okay thank you okay leah okay um hi guys thank you so much everyone this has been terrific um i guess i'll start with tanya because you were first tanya um, with regard to maybe shifting the way that the seasons run, I just want to give parents a warning because it seemed to me that parent uh, kids might need to make choices. So if you're a football player and a hockey player, um, those might both land in the spring. And so might parents have to prepare or kids have to prepare themselves to make priority choices there? So without getting into too many details, only because the MIA board has not presented this five season model yet. Um, they did break it up so students would not have to make choices. Um, so you're not going to see football and lacrosse in the same season because those are two that would potentially be the same students playing those sports. Pretty much what it does is over the course of the whole year, it breaks up in a shortened between seven and nine week seasons. So there is an overlap. And potentially if we were to go with that model, a student could play up to five sports in one year instead of just their typical three. So it actually could give more opportunities um, for students than what they already have right now. 
Awesome. And then um, for you, Tanya, as well, not to um, pour salt on the wound, but um, what's going on with Triple E and all of what you have to deal with on that front? So um, obviously this is something that Rob has already made me aware of in the area. Um, it's something that as a league, we've already talked about um, no night games. So right now we have very few night games scheduled in our, in my first version of a fall schedule. Um, and what we did is we scheduled night games because it's easier to go from a night game back to a day game than to schedule night games later on because of officials. Mm -hmm. So right now, my first schedule, we do have night games, but I can easily change that to afternoon games. And like I said, my 18 and 20 game schedules right now are going to change anyways with a delayed start to fall or a change of fall. So I'm assuming that we will not have night games again um, this coming fall season, whatever it looks like. And might it be possible for kids to, because if they're on a hybrid schedule and their cohort is at home three days a week, they might need to find transportation to the school for practice on those three days? Yes, and that's something that, you know, I'd have to meet with our district administrative team and Superintendent okay. Clenchy decide what that looks like. And if we're in that hybrid model, are we, allowing both cohorts to come together in the afternoon? Are we keeping it just with one cohort? Um, and so I would suggest too that that came up today with the commissioner's meeting and we are awaiting guidance. So for us to say anything tonight on that front would be foolhardy. Yep. All right, thanks Tanya. Th and I really appreciate you being here considering you are technically on leave. On, on maternity leave. Yeah, I don't think, but I don't think you had any maternity leave. No, not much. We get, we get to snuggle during the day though. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a couple more questions. Uh, maybe I'll jump to Raina really quick because it's perhaps short. Mm -hmm. um, Raina, will all of the people who are currently registered be secured a seat in your program? I wish I could say yes definitively, but that's going to really depend upon their the flexibility of the families because if, for the sake of argument, they wanted a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday schedule, but then the hybrid model and cohort group that they're in is Wednesday and Friday, that means can they be flexible? I, um, I think, honestly, I'm going to speak to that, Raina. There are no guarantees right now on that right. at all. All right, so parents need to prepare for more flux and fluidity there. Um, might the um, need for additional staff create a need to raise tuition? Well, when I said additional staff, we will not be having as many kids for, for, for starters. So I think that the ratios will be smaller regardless. And then the other piece that I think will help to support what I call more you know, vigilance would be the potential of having some of our high school students who we do pay. However, I also started, or I wanted to start a program with, um, a program I was working on with um, Todd that we were very excited about offering with younger, when I say younger, the freshmen and sophomores who could potentially be mentors and learn how to be an adult aide. Cause I, it's a feeder program that I already have six kids who I love, I would love to bring on and it would be something that would benefit them but also prosper the program. So that's how I would envision it. I think Leah too, it goes back to even district-wide as we've brought, brought up before that we see the potential for redeployment of different staff and the same would hold true. So you're gonna try to keep the tuition like stable? As stable. We're trying to keep as much stable as we can tuition or anything else. Right. Okay, so now I'll just move over to Joan. Hi, Joan. Hi. Um, so let's see here. This is perhaps a Brooke question, but um, you raised the specter of reimbursing parents for transportation. Mm -hmm. So will that become a bigger conversation beyond special education transportation for parents who volunteer to transport their own kids? No, I don't see that. That has not come up, up at all with the Commissioner of Education. I would say, though, I am so appreciative of the number of parents who have reached out to me suggesting that I reach back out to them if we see a need for them to transport their children. So I'm very, very grateful for that. No, I, it's, it's a very different um, category and we would not be receiving any type of reimbursement uh, through our pockets at the district level, which is very different than, uh, than Joan's world. 
Right. The regulations require that we provide transportation. So if you are required to do that, you know, obviously we want to be thoughtful and reimburse. And um, Desi supported that uh, we reimburse parents for transportation because there was very little guidance when ESY opened. Got it. Um, and so you said that we have 600 students and their service grids that need to be managed. Um, do you know at all what percentage of the 600 qualifies high needs right now? So I don't want to really give you a ballpark this minute because um, I, I just did this work yesterday and I just finished the high school today. So I certainly can provide that data from you going forward, but I have not really calculated. Now the next step is really to work with the principals around scheduling. Um, and that work was all day yesterday and most of this afternoon. Got it, what a huge task that is. Now, what about 504 students? Is that under your umbrella, Joan? So Lisa and I share that, but I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> So would you, do you envision any students who are on 504s needing to be in school more than the two days? So typically um, uh, kids that are on 504s are not getting specifically designed instruction, but more accommodations to access the curriculum. Okay, so that's probably a no. Right. Um, so I guess the biggest question is for me, I'm imagining that our high needs population, like our ballpark, let's say it's 20%. So those 20% of our 600 obviously need priority, but what about the 80%, right? These are the kids who perhaps, you know, need a little bit of reading instruction. They need a little bit of execu executive functioning uh, assistance, you know, the rest of the kids. How are we going to pull out provide pull-out services for, I know you talked about confidentiality and all of those um, logistical challenges, but how are we gonna provide these services for all of these kids? Is that something that you're cranking through as well? I certainly am, so yeah. that's I don't, really, think that, I don't know that you've got any real answers on that yeah. either, Joan, to be it's, honest with you. It's really a high examination of, um, you know, obviously, we don't do one-to-one -one services. We want kids in small groups. So we need to think about how thoughtfully we can provide small group pullout instruction within a cohort. So that's really gonna take some time. Um, I'm thankful for the principals because they work very close with me um, on aligning schedules. And it's a conversation we've already started, but I can't tell you that we have put, you know, schedules to paper. So for, for an example, this is another one of those areas where the messages are a bit mixed because we've been told that they really can't, whatever the small group instruction look, looks like, all children need to be facing the front of the room. I don't know what this is going to look like. So I think though that's where some of this guidance it becomes very confusing for us to find our way to navigate through. So um, there, there's that. That's just an example of why some, sometimes we don't have answers as we sit here tonight. Right. But you will try to make sure that whatever the service delivery that the kids require based upon their goals and benchmarks will drive that distance pullout service. Yes. Okay. We are it won't just that. Be, it's not gonna just be like check-ins and let's work on your work from you know X class, but it's gonna be real service delivery. Yeah, well, if, if we have, when we have students in person in a hybrid model, we are going to build those services in during that hybrid time. That is our goal. Okay, and I guess my last question is, um, I feel like ESY is providing you with an interesting case study um, on how we can mm -hmm. keep our kids safe. Not that they are guinea pigs by any stretch, but, mm -hmm. I wonder um, what can we learn about safety practices from the ESY program? And um, is it possible for us to survey the teachers and the parents who experienced ESY and then look over that data to hear from them what, what they experienced around safety? So before Joan, before you answer this, <clears throat> I, I would just put this out there. You're absolutely right. <coughs> Excuse me. We we too see that this was almost a model for us to 
dip our toe in the water on this. So I think there are things that we've learned almost daily if I think about it, Joan, whether it was the, the toy washing or the what, you know, all those things right. that you couldn't see ahead of time until after it started to play itself out. And so I would say that we gained, um, we gained a lot of perspective through this program. And so you guys are going to maybe quantify that in some <coughs> way to kind of push that out so that we can learn from it? Yeah, so I think there's definitely lessons learned and I feel like the faculty as they as we meet with them and talk to them, you know, uh, Steve and I talk at least three, four, five times a day. Um, faculty reach out with questions, you know, we are brainstorming on um, different types of situations and I think that we have we're going to be the leaders in terms of what types of protocols mm -hmm. should be in place and i think that our teachers are going to be a great deal of support for other teachers coming back because of the things they've learned um i think it's going to be very helpful okay thank you all right thank you guys that's it oh, for me brett, thank you thank you brett any questions Brett? No. Okay, thank you. Rich, any questions? Rich? Sharon? Rich, Rich was struggling with his Wi-Fi. Oh, okay. Let me go to Sharon. Any questions, Sharon? Ka Kathy. Oh, oh, oh yes. Yeah, uh, Hello. You there? <laughs> Thanks Leah, for that characterization. Uh, okay. I don't have any questions. No questions? Okay, Sharon. I just um, wanted to ask for a little bit more clarification uh, following up on Leah's question about um, <clears throat> services for the theoretical 80% that aren't on the, um, the highest level of need. Um, will they be able to receive their therapies like OTPT? those types of therapies that often, um, they're not group things, but they are out pull out services? Yes. We're doing those services this summer. Okay. Um, and that will be part of the hybrid? Yes. Assuming that that's the model that we go with? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have a just general thought to throw out there and that is that, I understand that just, and this is, I guess, for everyone, um, that you want to make sure that what you put out is, is the definitive answer or the correct answer and that you have all the information before you put it out. Um, I also think that from the perspective of a parent, um, in the absence of information, people create their own narratives. And so any information that can come out saying, you know, we don't know all the answers yet and this answer might change before you get this letter, but this is what we're working on and this is what we have now is going to bring down that level of anxiety. Um, I, I think that the things that I am seeing are people creating their own stories because they don't have information and so their anxieties are you know, ramping up. I don't have any information. I don't know what's going to happen. And so therefore, this is what I think is going to happen. Sharon, I'm, I'm uh, hoping that you're only talking SPED right now, because I don't know if we could have put out any more information. In no, I, I am. I am talking SPED. Yes. Okay. In, in all fairness, I, I want to say again, we just continue to get the drip drip on SPED. So it, it, it's an area that we don't have a lot of guidance on. Right and now. If I could jump in, um, and I think uh, Amy referenced people calling her with concerns and Sharon, perhaps you are hearing from people who have concerns. They should be talking or sending their questions um, to Brooke or if they're SPED parents, they have a line uh, to Joan. And so um, anything that is sent exclusively to the school committee in terms of questions, we channel it or I specifically channel it to Brooke and then Brooke channels it to either Joan or Todd. That's our protocol. So sometimes you guys are a, um, um, are a, uh, you know, just somebody they can talk to. But if you're hearing that, oh, I don't know. It's important that we encourage people 
to, to get to direct their questions to the people who can answer them or can say definitively, great question, we're gonna add it to our fact. We don't have all the information yet. So um, I would encourage the whole committee that if you're hearing from people who feel frustrated and they don't know and they're <laughs> creating their own narrative, direct them to um, their, their principals um, or to Brooke will make sure whatever department in central office can answer the question can do that. So, and it also um, takes the onus um, off of you. We, we, we had a, a previously in CPAC, we were dealing with this, that people were going to the CPAC uh, coordinate, uh, co-chairs and not to Joan. And they don't know, but we, we I think we've been able to to uh, revert, you know, change that trend. So just, um, um, you know, a thought on that. So I, I don't mean to, um, <clears throat> let me be clear. I have not had any specific conversations with any individuals um, at all. Okay. Um, so that's not something that I've heard from individuals. I, it's from the gist of what I see you know, when I'm reading emails or Facebook or, you know, wherever, it's just the Don't kind of- the read Facebook, stay away from social media. We only uh, deal with emails. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just kind of wanted to put that out there as a, sure. from the parent perspective, and I did have a child on an IEP um, who is no longer at Neshoba, but, um, you know, from the perspective of a parent with a child who has been on an IEP, um, no information makes anxiety more information, even if you can't tell me the, the absolute definitive answer right now, just the, the message of, I am working so hard on that is big. It's really big. Right. That, that's kind of where I was. Okay. Sure, but I think that that people have. I mean, you know, I, I think um, any presentation we have, and we encourage, and certainly we've had uh, reasons for people to want to reach out to us and get information this year. Um, but information, questions that come to the school committee get um, responded to and um, given to Brooke, and Brooke makes sure that they go to the right people to answer them. So I don't want anybody to feel anxious unduly, but I, I, I take your point, Sharon. I understand what you're saying. And I would never try to respond. I would always- Let me do it. Send it on. I will always send it on to you, Kathy. Thanks. Okay. Um, all set, um, Sharon? I'm all set. Okay. So let's see. Mike, where are you? Any questions, Mike? Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hi, um, I have, uh, I, I think may, two, maybe three questions um, and they do all fall under the, um, the, uh, the SPED umbrella. I just wanna thank all of our presenters for sharing out what they shared today. Um, so uh, to Joan, I, I guess my first question has to be kind of preempted by a clarification. It sounds to me like there is an acknowledgement that in order for um, some kids to have their classroom integration and their services might be in school, in like in school, four days of the five day week rather than the two, is that correct? In order to receive both? Yes. Okay. Okay, so I guess in that vein, um, you know, the notion that some kids will be receiving two days of classroom integration um, and then two days of services can potentially be misleading, particularly for those that aren't sure whether or not their SPED child or children qualify for such amendments to the model. Um, so it might be helpful um, maybe for the, for the school committee, but also for the public to define maybe more formally what high needs students really means, um, because it seems like that is our target population that will be receiving this double instruction. Sure, I, I, I can certainly, I thought I went through that criteria, but if you would like me to put it in writing, I'd be happy sure, to I, do that. No, not, not in writing. I, 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 if I missed it, I apologize, but no, yeah, she, actually she did. She did review it tonight. Yeah, but um, we can uh, we can certainly get that to you, Mike. Okay, 
uh, so I guess the, the follow-up question is, um, are the um, programs such as Life Skills or Early Risers or the Center School, do, do all of the students that populate those pro programs, are those considered high need students? Yes. Okay, great. I just wanted to clarify that. No, that's a great question. Um, and so if a, if, a, if a parent were curious, for example, wait, I wonder if my student qualifies as a high need, they could contact you directly or I guess review. I, I think what we'll be doing is contacting parents to talk right. with them because the communication obviously should be fluid and we should have that conversation with parents. So my intent now that we've identified who those students are is that we will be um, sending out communication to those parents. Great. Uh, and just as a side, it's, it's, um, it's pretty comforting to know that there have been amendments to this hybrid model to accommodate for those needs. That's very much appreciated, I think, by um, a lot of people in our community. So um, I appreciate that separate track that we're on. Um, my other question, or my, I don't know if it's been two or three, but um, I'm thinking of our youngest learners um, that might have a, a, um, a substantially difficult time learning remotely. And so, you know, let's say we talk about our kindergartners or our first or second graders who, if they are re receiving, for instance, ABA services, remotely, it's not going to be nearly as effective as if they were to receive those services in person only because a screen simply feels different or it's associated with, um, you know, maybe a different part of their day. So how do we evaluate what is best for those kinds of, of kids and how do we make accommodations for that? So again, I think that students that are getting ABA services, um, typically a lot of our students are getting that, would be in that high needs category. And um, Desi has said, um, our youngest students need to be a priority, especially preschool, because I think that, you know, the kids that are turning three and four, we want to provide intervention out of the gate with those students. So I think that the student you just described to me that might be getting a lot of ABA services, I don't think a screen is going to appropriately provide those services. And we have students getting those services in ESY right now. They are in the program and they're coming in. So I would see that as a high priority student. Uh, so great to hear. Thank you, Joan. I appreciate everything. Thanks, Thank you. Joseph. Do you have any questions? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. I have uh, two questions, one from Ms. Rich and one from Ms. DeAngelis. And I'll start with Ms. Rich, and it's a two-part question. She may know the first, well, she probably will know the uh, answer to the first part of it, may not know the second part. My first question is, and if she mentioned something about this during presentation, forgive me, um, what about spectators at athletic events? Has the MIAA or have your fellow <laughs> athletic directors addressed this issue? We have not received any guidance around spectators yet. Okay, so that th that question remains unresolved at this point. Okay, my second question pertains to facilities use, and I've noticed at least in Lancaster there have been some what I perceive to be uh, private outside athletic organizations that have already begun utilizing uh, the athletic facilities at the Mayor Rollinson with the Burbank schools. Um, does the district have any? oversight or any uh, involvement in outside use or is that all handled at the municipal level? So it depends on the site. So at Neshoba, the fields are closed because the district owns the high school facility and no one is renting or using our high school fields right now. When it comes to the town fields, that's where it's kind of the gray area and the t it's up to the towns and that's where I think groups are congregating and using those fields on the different towns. Would you assume that's correct, Brooke? Yeah, it, it's a really great area for us. And um, we've brought this up. We've had discussion with our town administrators as, as well because we, we were trying to maintain some consistency across the district on it. We ultimately, I think, Tony, just correct me if I'm wrong. I think that we ultimately agreed that we would open the um, tennis courts, I believe is what we opened, right? Um, and you know, we have a follow-up meeting on this very topic, I think on Monday. 
uh, just to let you know, but it's, yeah, it creates some gray area for us. And initially the thinking from the, the town administrators is that we, um, that the school district would make the, the decisions on that. So um, I, I don't know if there are some groups that are out there using that, Joseph, I, that would be news to me. No, I, I appreciate that, Madam Superintendent. And like I said, um, I assume that it was a private outside organization. It looked like a football uh, practice. Uh, and it looked like, you know, obviously it was on the athletic fields at Mayor Rollinson, which I would assume was under the purview of the town of Lancaster. Okay, so if I have any further questions on that, I'll take it up with Mr. Pacheco and, and just inquire in that regard. Uh, my question for Ms. DeAngelis is, and again, I'll preface it by saying, if you meant, I think you did mention this, and if I, you know, if I, if I zoned out, given the idyllic environment in which I'm sitting in right now, I apologize. But one of the issues you brought up, and I know that you've discussed this with the co-chair of CPAC, but we had a long conversation about this last night, and I was somewhat intrigued by this issue. Uh, it's regarding the confidentiality issues regarding the delivery of services. Mm -hmm. And what uh, the, the co-chair had discussed with me was the notion that what the district might want to consider would be waivers of confidentiality. And I don't know if that was actually done during the spring and it was, whether it's being considered for the fall. And do you know any of the legalities attended to that regarding HIPAA violations or HIPAA waivers and, and uh, confidentiality waivers? And where are we, if anywhere, with developing waivers for parents who want the remote services but and are, and are willing to waive confidentiality issues? Yeah, so um, I've thought a lot about this and I think the guidance in the spring is so much different than the guidance in the fall. So I wanna be really clear about that. Um, it was, you know, very different than what we're expected to do in the fall. So when I think about those confidentiality waivers, if kids are getting services and parents elect remote and we're, we wanna provide either some asynchronous or synchronous lessons through a virtual format, you know, one of the things like um, we, we don't do just one-on-one -on -one groups. I mean, our caseloads for related services could never, we could never provide one-to-one -one for every student. So if you look at our caseloads, of speech and language pathologists, they have maybe 45 students on a caseload. So we're seeing two and three students in a small group. So if we were gonna do that virtually, you know, some parents are okay with doing that virtually in a small group and other parents are not. So I think we need to be really careful. I've gotten feedback both ways of just do it and schedule it. And I have other parents saying, I'm not sure that I want that information shared with other families. So I think that that's what makes it complex. So I am going to look for some legal guidance around this because I think that um, in the event, the governor makes the decision that no matter what, um, we are closed down completely. We're going to really need to think about that, having those waivers out. And I would like to be ahead of that, not behind it. So I hope that Thank you very much, Ms. Daniels. Appreciate that. That's Thank all I have, Madam Superintendent. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, Mary, any questions? Okay, and, and next time I don't want to be this far down the line. If no, I'll start with you first next. All right, okay, that's good. And then, then um, Elaine, well, I have to start. With, just go, Mary. I'll all right. It out. So, so I, I do want to thank all of our presenters tonight, as well as um, I did view the Bolton uh, Forum, as well as the Lancaster Forum. I didn't watch the whole Lancaster because there was some repetition. Um, but I, so to thank um, Lisa, Rob, um, Brooke and Todd, great, great job. And Ira Lane, who not only watched the chat, but then came up with um, questions to ask at the end and pull it. So she was, she was multitasking. She did amazing. She was really, a rock star for Really us. good job. And um, so w w I think that that shows people who are watching or people who might watch this at another point, um, the district is really endeavoring to give as much information as they have um, as, you know, as soon as they're able to share it, they, they really are doing that. And I expect that that will, um, that that will really continue. I, I also want to say that the predominant theme of the recent emails that we've received as school committee. So this is, um, you know, what Amy, Leah, Sharon, Mike um, talked about. The questions have predominantly had to do with special education. And so Joan, um, it was, it, it really is great to have, you know, certainly Brooke and Kathy, you know, channeling those to you, but just 
somewhat in defense of how many questions there are about special education, that has been the predominant note or theme. Um, and so Mike really had most of my question, but it's, I, I'm going to just pose it anyway, um, because it seems that, first of all, I do like that, that expression, our most complex learners. Joan, I think that that is such a wonderful way to refer to our students um, who have special needs. Um, so some of our, our um, high needs students with special needs will be participating in, let's say, both the A and the B cohorts. And, um, and so I want, and I think about their, um, I think about relationships for them. And I think, I wonder if you've considered, and I know that you all have been talking so much about all of this, but considering whether students would predominantly, uh, those, those students with high needs predominantly belong to one cohort for relationships, for academics, for specials, and perhaps receive most of their service deliveries in the other cohort? And that's, that's my question. So I think that's really complex because every student's IEP is very individualized. So I guess that what I wanna to say to that is, you know, some students get reading services every day or math services every day or organizational and study skills every day. So mm -hmm. um, we have a couple things that we need to think about. One is the regulation says we can't, we're not supposed to have, it's supposed to be 51 peers, 49% split so that there are peer models to learn from, especially when you're in inclusionary type setting. So we will do our best to do that, but I also think that we will need to cohort and group some of those students together so they can get the services that they need. And we're gonna have to do that very carefully and thoughtfully. And I'm sure that's gonna be very complex, but I know that my building principals um, spent a lot of time with me the last two days. Um, and they are up for the challenge of working with me around this. I think, too, Mary, if I can just make a comment, we, we had um, put out there a number of different venues to please submit questions for tonight so that we could try to interweave some of the responses in the presentation rather than going to a question, answer, question, answer, like we did with our forms. So um, I think that there's every reason in the world why more of those came through in the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. Mary, all set. Other questions? All set. Thanks. Steve, question. Z. He's good. So Elaine, questions? Uh, first, thank you all three for the presentations. They were great. Um, Tanya, no questions for you, but I did want to say that I was impressed by the creativity in some of the, let's call them possibilities that you put out there. Um, and I, I thought that was really cool. So thank you for that. Um, Raina, I just had one quick question for you because I wasn't sure if I was understanding something that you said correctly. Um, you talked about how extended learning could run on a remote day. And I was wondering if you were talking about like a Wednesday when everyone is remote or if you were talking about how a kid could, if, if a kid was on a Monday, Tuesday cohort, they could be eligible for extended learning on a Thursday, Friday. And if those were after school hours or if you were talking about having like an extended day type program during the school day. I was thinking more in terms of that Wednesday when it, you know, that was my initial thinking. But again, it's going to depend upon and I, I hate to keep using the conditional phrase. It depends, but it will depend upon how many students we're talking about. But I because that day is going to be if it is, in fact, the Model C, that will be a very interesting day for a lot of families. Um, and I'm hoping that we come to some resolution somewhat soon so that we can let our families know. But that was the day I was thinking. Okay. Oh, Todd looks like he has something he would like to add. Just to chime in on that, Elaine, the comprehensive plan that we have to get to the Department of Ed by August 10th must include what we are doing with students in the after hours as well as some with the before hours of school. That is a required component of the comprehensive plan. So part of Raina's program will be instrumental in what we turn in for that plan because we do need to account for, like you would in a normal school day, if we were in school, what are you offering in those times that is you know, considered off learning? So just to be clear on that. Okay, but only the days that the kids would be in person in school. Uh, correct, but I think too, if we are going to a remote learning or a hybrid model, they certainly wanna know, you know what you're doing you know, all hours of during that day. Okay. kids are doing anything 
would be doing anything remote, e even if it were to be enrichment, you know, I, even out of the regular classroom, what are you offering for kids, you know, in those after hours? Um, oh, okay. Yep. So that's just a, that's a required component of the plan, just so everyone's aware. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I do have a few questions for Joan as well. Okay. Um, the first one I wanted to ask about is I'm guessing there's probably a lot of regression with a number of the students or probably all of the students um, who are on IEPs right now. And I know that given the complexity of everything already, it's probably be really hard to help them sort of make up um, some of that, some of those losses. But what have you thought about that we could possibly do to try to get kids back um, to where they were before the shutdown started? So ESY, so anytime we, um, we collect data around um, regression of skills with students during breaks. So we've serviced as many, as many students as we can during ESY to prevent regression. Um, and then for kids that may have regressed because um, they may not have ESY, I think that, you know, we have to thoughtfully look at where kids are. I suspect, honestly, all kids have regressed. Let's, let's face it. It has been really challenging for them not to have in-person instruction. And I think that over the summer, um, if you look at the research, we expect kids, all kids to regress. Um, to a degree, right? Because we're away from school and our brain's not working. My brain is working all the time. So um, I don't think I've regressed at all. I think I don't sleep most nights. But um, so I think we're going to see that throughout the district. I think one of the things we need to do is really thought, thoughtfully think of where are kids, where are we beginning, and where do we want to adapt skill and instruction and target instruction to get their skills back where they are. Um, in terms of reading, that was a, one of my biggest worries was around reading and um, Lexia has been, that's one of the things I instituted and the district adopted um, for the fall. That really gave us some really good assessment data of where students were and so students are working in Lexia so they can get some instruction and it really gives you a snapshot of skills in each area per grade level and then it gives you some data and feedback of what needs to be targeted, what needs to be remediated, and where, where are students in terms of grade level functioning. So I think that's been really helpful and we're going to continue to use that next year. Um, I think we've adopted it now district-wide. So I'm really excited about that. And then for our middle schoolers, there's a version called Power Up. Um, and we've been using that. The district has IXL Math. That's a remedial math program to reinforce math skills. Um, but I have to be honest with you. I think that when we come back, we need to make kids feel comfortable, safe, and really focus on social emotional. Cause I will tell you having them come into ESY was wondering how they were gonna be feeling. And it was like, there was almost some relief in some kids, you know, some, you know, trepidation to begin with in the first couple of days. And then really being able to talk about what their time at home has been like. And so I feel like we've kind of really been able to dig into that and work on that some this summer. and. You know, if you were out today, the kids were out playing under the sprinkler and we had a bubble machine where they were chasing the bubbles together and they were apart. And, you know, school is life for our students, right? So I think we need to make sure socially and emotionally they're in a good place so they can't, they're they available for learning. And, um, you know, we have such a committed group of faculty. They are amazing people that I know they will do their very best to bring the kids forward. Thank you. Yeah, I also think that the social emotional um, and like what you said, being in a good place to learn, um, it, it is really important. Um, I did some quick numbers when you were talking about ESY, if I got them down correctly. Mm -hmm. And it looks like um, of the students who offered remote services to, you said only about half access them. Mm -hmm. And even the students that were offered in-person services, it looks like about 20% either chose the remote or declined them totally. Mm -hmm. um, so in thinking about some of the things that Mike asked and Leah asked about these students that kind of don't fall into this high needs category, there's a high likelihood they're going to have remote services um, if they choose to. So what can we do to sort of beef up the effectiveness or the quality of the remote services offered? Because um, I do think that we're going to need to use them a lot. 
So I think that one of the things that you know, we're going to work on with teaching and learning is what does that remote academy look like and how will we provide those services? You know, I've encouraged our students with high complex needs. I have to respect the fact that people have medical situations or medically complex you know, complications that they don't want to expose their students, and I have to respect that. But at the same time, you know, um, some of these students can't um, access virtual services, so it's it's very complicated. And I think that um, we've done a lot. Of, if you looked at our remote learning site from last year, our related service providers. Um, our, our school counselors did a lot of asynchronous lessons so that kids could watch lessons and listen to things or be read a book and asked questions. Um, and I, I can't guarantee that our highest and most complex students are going to benefit even for a one-to-one -one virtual because some kids have a really hard time staying even on the screen, especially our youngest kids. So um, I think it's going to be a challenge, and I think that we will continue to do our very best work to deliver services. You know, providing you know multi-century reading online without the tools is really challenging. It's not the best way to teach that type of reading. So um, I guess we'll do the best we can, and we'll continue to refine our practices to give the very best services that we can based on parents decisions. Okay, I think um, similar to something that came up at the forum last night, someone was talking about could we do a demo of what like a remote schedule looks like or what the remote platform looked like so that people realize it's different than what happened in the spring. Um, and I think maybe the same thing is true for special education services too, providing some sort of an example of saying, well, this is actually sort of an example of what it would look like in the fall versus this is what it looked like in the spring will kind of help people um, think about how things will be different because um, sometimes it, it sometimes it's just hard to visualize and it's hard to think about and it's hard to put um, in uh, into more concrete terms in your own head as a parent and yet the parents are making decisions on their children's education based right. on some of these like abstract conceptual things so I think the more that we when we have the answers the more that we can sort of break it down very concretely um, would really would really help um, um, I did want to ask again about the pre-K guidance. So you gave a great example about ESY guidance coming right before the start of ESY um, and that being really difficult. Um, but I think if you hadn't sent out the letters to the families, then they wouldn't have known anything until like a couple, any, anything until a couple days right. before. Um, so pre-K sort of feels like the same thing. I mean, I think you have tuition payments for peer models coming up soon. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if there's there's any information that can sort of be shared about that, um, it would help with that sort of surprise and that might come at any time. I, I Pat, Pat will be my witness if she's here. There she is. Um, I said to her, this is what I think we should do. Here's my plan. And this was, you know, last Wednesday. I think this is what makes the most sense for our inclusion and in our role models. Um, we had a couple of parents who have decided not to have their students be role models. I'm like, okay, let's fill those slots. I have a plan to move forward. And I literally sat at a Desi meeting at one o'clock on Thursday and they were like, don't do anything with inclusionary preschool. We're going to give you guidance. And I haven't gotten any yet. So, you know, there's a meeting every week or every two weeks. And I, I wait with, you know, bated breath, but again, I need to move forward for our students. So I did that with ESY and I said, if I get a guidance document, I said to Brooke, if I get a guidance document on July 4th, I'm gonna keep moving ahead and we're gonna open the program and I'll just tailor it based on that new guidance. So, um, you know, kind of doing the best we can based on the information we get that's ever changing, but just know that Lots of districts didn't open with ESY, but because yeah. we planned so far in advance, I just kept shifting. I just kept shifting and shifting and shifting four times. I landed at plan D with a couple of tweaks to plan D when I got the July 4th guidance, but um, I'm worried about preschool. Yeah, yeah. and, I, I, um, and that, that approach seems perfectly reasonable. I think I don't have a lot of faith in Desi in that even if they do send out the guidance that it will be helpful or specific or what you would have been waiting for um, in order to make decisions. I have a feeling guidance could quite possibly come out that leaves you no better off than where you are right now. 
And I so what I will what I will tell you is when that happens to me, I call my boss and I say to her, here's what I'm planning to do. And I would like support. Um, and she typically says, go. And then when we get guidance, I then communicate with the families that I need to shift. So I'm not going to wait until, you know, August 30th. I will be honest with you, Elaine, like that's too late. Families need to make plans and I'm really concerned if they say no role models, because I think that's not good for our inclusion preschool. So please know I have a plan. Um, I will shift it if they keep saying next week, next week, next week, because I have to sit online and listen to, yeah, we'll have guidance in a couple weeks on that. And it's, yeah. it's frustrating for us as well. And we're left as the district professionals to provide the very best for kids with no answer. So I just keep forging ahead with my plan. So Pat knows my plan already. Um, Brooke knows the plan I have in place. And if I have no answers, I'm going to move that plan. And I might have to say to parents, this is what I want to do. And I'm going to move forward. And if I have to make revisions based on the guidance, please know I'll communicate that with you. Sure, and I know you and your boss would never say anything bad about Jesse, but I have no problem with it. So. <laughs> I, I think this is hard. I mean, everybody's in uncharted waters, you know? So yeah. um, I think outside of the box, most of the time this has pushed me, to, has stretched me to far limits of thinking outside of the box, but. Sure, um, and just one last quick question. Um, speaking of timelines, do you have a general idea of when parents would know if they fall into that um, sort of high needs bucket. Some of it's obvious in certain programs, but then it sounded like kids with like significant pull out might not be clear to families, or I guess mm -hmm. it's more important for families to know if they are not in that bucket because that will um, affect their planning for the fall. Right, year. so uh, that's why I've committed to this week to really, um, okay. do, I mean, I went through all the service delivery grids by myself, 600, I went through every single one. I then met individually with the principals to go through all of the service provisions. So I suspect I will probably be able to let them know soon. I'll inform them um, through mail, send them a letter, okay. um, mail like I did for ESY. Okay, great. That's my next group of letters, so. <laughs> sure, all right, that's it for me, thank you. All right, thank you. I think I've um, everyone's had an opportunity to ask their questions. So I want to thank Joan and Tanya and Raina again for your the incredible work you've done during this time. Um, it's just it's you know everybody's used the the, the term um, uncharted territory and we've never experienced anything. I mean it, it's just it's just phenomenal. Um, and I know that that Brooke and Joan are too professional and would never disparage Desi. Um, but I'm not under their iron grip any longer. And I am just, it just bothers me so much to see how hard um, people in, I know in this district, other districts as well, but, but just the, the time, the effort and the setting things up so that you plan something, but then you're also planning, you have to pivot. And I'm very disappointed in the lack of leadership, the lack of support, the kick in the can down the road type of thing, but I have confidence in the work that, that our folks are doing um, from everyone, our, our faculty, our staff, our administrators. So I just wanna thank you uh, because it's been nonstop since March. So, and we still have a ways to go. So thank you. And I think Brooke, if you wanna give out your general update, Sure, just a couple of quick things. First of all, too, I know it's not on here, but uh, Tanya, before you leave, I just wanna say thank you so much for all of your help and support with graduation, which is not on our agenda. And, you know, I know that, um, like, we, I, I can't remember who, maybe it was Todd and I were talking today, Falmouth, for example, I think had to cancel their Friday night and they had their graduation on the Saturday morning. And I think it was Maynard as well, one who had canceled, I think Friday afternoon for Friday night. Um, and all because of COVID uh, related cases. And, um, you know, we, we, were, we were so fortunate that that didn't happen. Um, 
But, you know, Tanya, again, somebody who's supposed to be on maternity leave, and there you were up in the press box, you know, helping to support Joel, who brought the sound system in. And uh, Kathy, you were there. Steve, I know you were there. Brett, you were there. Thank you so much. And I mean, it was like on that turf field, it's like 10 or 12, uh, 10 to 15 degrees higher than it really is, you know. And so it was hot. It was very, very hot. And, you know, the process that we took, you know, the, the notion of having to push the, the, the diploma, for example, across the table with gloves on our hands. And I mean, for something that just felt so strange in a weird way, it felt so normal and it, it just, it felt wonderful. And I, I just think it was so successful and um, just so proud of everybody. So to, to everybody that was involved with our graduation Saturday uh -huh. morning, um, we just want to say thank you so much. So just before you get, if you uh, sign off, Tanya, thanks so much for that. Um, so uh, just a couple of uh, quick updates too. And I, I realize the time is already so late and we were so hoping for a short meeting tonight um, because I, I feel guilty because I feel that we've taken out so much of especially our school committee's time, because this is a volunteer job. And, you know, it, it's it's not just even this. I mean, it, it's the fact that so, uh, some of you are, I mean, Elaine, this is meetings every night this week for you. And again, you, you're you a rock star on that chat line. And we're so grateful for you. Thank you very much, because you're able to answer questions. You're able to help direct people. You're able to then call out questions. And, you know, well, we really appreciate it. And so a lot of you are putting in double time right now. I'm just so grateful for that. That, so thank you so much. Um, so I felt very good about the the um, the, the meetings. The, the I guess we call, we we continue to call them our, our question forums, um, and in, in part we set it up uh, you know as a result of the steering committee, um, and as some of our moms on the steering committee were uh, we've got fabulous parents involved, I'll tell you, at all of the different levels, whether it's a, the steering committee, the working groups, or the um, ta individual task forces. They're just doing great work so we're thrilled with that and they were really the ones that, that suggested the format that we used and I think it was a very successful format I don't think we could have gotten through the you know the hundred plus questions that we did in those two uh, sessions if we hadn't done it the way that we did so uh, looking forward to tomorrow night um, the starting date for the 2021 school year we want to do a touch base on that um, and I think um, we'll do a Todd and I'll just do a bit of a follow-up once we talk about the starting date and the mask uh, policy and then Todd you and I can just kind of do a wrap-up. So let's talk about the school calendar really quickly. Anne-Marie I'm going to turn this over to you. I think everybody probably knows right now that uh, we've got the 10 additional days. Commissioner is, made it abundantly clear today Todd would you not say abundantly clear those days will be used at the front of the school year nowhere else. So here we sit tonight with that, that premise in mind. So Anne-Marie, I turn it over to you. Thank you. So right, the 10 additional days at the start of the school year to help prepare for the reopening, which means reducing the student year from 100, potentially from 180 days to 170 days, so long as the students start school um, no later than September 16th. So our calendar, as it's already been approved, we always have every year we have two staff days before the students arrive. And this year we were going to have those, but they were going to be separated. They are going to be separated by voting day. So on August 31st, we'll have our first staff day that was already on the calendar. And then there would be the, the day off of voting day. And then on Wednesday, the second would be our second staff day. And then originally the students were um, were to be returning on that next the next day, Thursday, the third, for two days before the holiday weekend. And then after the holiday on the 8th, everybody's back for good. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to have um, we're going to have eight additional days. So we'll have a total of 10 days before the students arrive. We'll have, as I just described, the August 31st and the day off for the voting. And then the um, then three days will take the Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, that first week in September. And in the second, second week of September, the first full week of September, there's a holiday on Monday. So we'll have four additional days after Labor Day, and then and then the week after that, on the Monday and Tuesday, we'll have days nine and 10 of our staff uh, pre-student days. That's the 14th and 15th. So we'll just make the uh, 16th deadline to return the students to school. So, in, so we'll have an additional two days that first week that has the voting week in it. We'll have an additional four days during for the staff only to 
during the holiday week, and then Monday and Tuesday of, um, after that for the total of 10 days, bringing the students back on the 16th. Any question on that? Um, Mike? Um, Henry, I'm not sure if this is a question for you or more for Brooke, but um, as the teachers are getting that professional development at the outset of the year, is that PD going to be done remotely or it will, will it be done in person? I think, I think it's too soon right now, Mike, for us to give you an answer tonight. And, and again, I would point out that I think so much can happen between tonight, July 20, whatever is it, 28th, 29th, and September 16th. Um, I think it would be foolhardy for us to nail that down right now, quite frankly. So Todd, I don't want to speak for no. you. But... Yeah, no, Mike, please know that my team is planning for both. So we'll be able to pivot on which, whichever way we need to go, whether it be remote or whether we're able to bring people in. Yeah. Um, you know, we're already planning those days right now. We've already planned for five. And then when we got word that we're getting 10, uh, we were obviously, as you can imagine, doing cartwheels um, in our living rooms yeah. um, because it's, you know, certainly needed PD for our, for our teachers, which will benefit the kids. So. And again, I just want to remind people, and I know I've said this in you know, our, our forums, but we have to remind people that our teachers really had no time to plan to organize this. I've, I think teachers are, are, are their, our own heroes. You know, when you take a look at what we've all been through here and um, they were expected to pivot in, on a four day notice and during that emergency time. So the flip side is I think we've learned so much between then and, you know, at graduation, I talked about opportunities and, you know, that dark times bring about opportunities. And I think that that's definitely what we see this as too in this very bizarre strange time that we're going through there are some some strange moments of opportunities and i think this is one i think our teachers are going to grow just enormously from some of the work that i i know that uh, todd and his team got planned for moving forward our remote next time will be nothing like what we experienced in the spring there's just no comparison, but it's a totally different time because we can plan. And now we've got 10 days to help, you know, support that. So it's just, uh, I would agree mm -hmm. with Todd. That was a, that was an incredible gift that we got those 10 days. So just so, as, a, as a quick follow-up. Um, oh, sorry. I, I know, yeah, you've got your hand up. I'm just gonna interject for a moment. Um, you know, when under typical conditions, when the machine is sort of running very well and all the gears mesh up, everything is synchronized, right? All the districts and all the, all the schedules are synchronized. And now that, and I'm thinking from the perspective of a teacher in another district, um, and really also uh, a parent of a household where both parents are working, as soon as we can get confirmation whether those days um, are going to be um, remote or in-person, I think that that helps um, I think that that would, I think that that would just be helpful to to to, to let staff know that. On, on behalf of like the, the school staff, like the, the 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 elementary schools, the middle school, and the high school. Okay. Yeah, we're not disagreeing. Leah. Right. Thank you. Um. So I'm just looking at the calendar, and I only want to just clarify what Amory said. So. Um, the normal, the day, the first day back for uh, staff was supposed to be August 31st. Yeah. And, um, and the second, and so we're not adding 10 days. We're actually adding eight, right? That's correct. We're adding eight, right? So our student year won't be 170. It will be 172. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So that's, and that's just a virtue of where Labor Day falls this year. And the voting didn't, you know, kind of. And the voting. A little yeah. Monkey too. Yeah. Got it. And so, I mean, there are some school districts that might only have 170, but by virtue of our original calendar, our kids are going to get 172 as of right now. Yeah. And I want to be cautious with that too. So yes, as we sit here tonight on July 29th, that's where it sits tonight. Okay. I think you're going to see that potentially subject to change, quite frankly. That's why I want to be really cautious with that. That I see that this is being fluid too over the course I, um, of the year. I just want to say one thing too, as a teacher, um, I've taken entire graduate classes in two weeks time. And so I think that whereas some people might think, oh, what could they accomplish in 10 days? I think that because teachers are such hard workers that they can actually accomplish a lot in a 10, lot. give teachers 10 days, they can get a lot done. 
And so I'm, I'm excited for those days. And I think that what you just said about the remote experience being wholly different, that these 10 days are going to mean an enormous world of difference. I agree completely. Brooke, you had another um, item about the mask policy. Could you cover that, please? Yeah, so one of the things, and, and actually um, this, again, news that comes out that you find out after you put something down on a, an agenda, <laughs> that's how fast our world is changing. I actually think that um, what I've heard through the grapevine that is the MASC is looking at the potential of creating um, a, a, basically a... Um, uh, renewed mask pol a policy for us that we can um, ha perhaps use. I would suggest to you that from my, um, my thinking right now and in talking to many other superintendents, um, I think that we're all very supportive of the notion of trying to, and I know this doesn't, mm -hmm. not all parents are going to agree with this, but I really would like to see us change and add a policy that says that we have masks mandated for K to 12, not just the DESE guideline right now. And my understanding is that um, the MESC is working on that. So I don't know, Kathy, if you've got any word on that or not. I have to talk to Dorothy Presser tomorrow. I would really appreciate it if you could, okay. because yep. I and I really want to give parents a head a heads up now that we we are consider if if you are if you would support my thinking on this and and uh, we could take a look at doing that. I I think that um, I'm getting mixed messages, not mixed messages, messages from parents that are kind of all over the board, and I understand that, but I think that we need to be looking at um, putting something in place, K to 12 for masks. Knowing full well that there are the exceptions to the rule, those odd exceptions to the rule that will fall, you know, probably under Jones purview uh, for those children that just, for whatever reason, medical or, or otherwise, cannot do it. But I think that, you know, we're looking at masks being mandatory on the buses right now, K to 12, to me, it just makes sense that we do this. And in talking to my colleagues across the state, I am seeing this pop up. And I would say almost, um, I, I don't know if it's gonna be 100%, but it's gonna be a high percentage of school districts are gonna ask their school committees for support, just as I am tonight, in considering a K to 12 mask. Okay, thank you. Um, Amy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, could you just elaborate on, I think you just said something about students who are not able to wear a mask for a medical reason, a um, special education reason, what is the approach for them? Like, are they, are those students going to have to automatically opt into a remote learning plan? Um, because I, I think I, I don't know, uh, Amy, that I think that again, uh, this is one of those things that I suspect that we are going to get further guidance on right now. So um, I, I don't know that there's there are clear cut um, guidelines in that area right now. But I would tell you that people from from my lens and from what I'm hearing across the state is people feel that there's a lot more comfort uh, for everyone, teachers. Um, and our students was going K to 12. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely understand the rationale behind that. I guess I'm mm -hmm. trying to get a more specific answer because, um, you know, there might be some parents who say, well, if everybody in that building is not wearing a mask, like, I'm not sure I want to send my kid to school. Oh, no, I'm, I'm getting emails that are saying that. And there are other parents mm -hmm. that say, like, well, I want my kid to go to school, but... Mm -hmm they can't wear a mask. And so- um, And I'm getting those emails as well. You're absolutely right. Yeah, and this came up during the um, mm -hmm. task force uh, meeting with Florence Sawyer. And so I think that, um, I, I know the situation is rapidly evolving, but that's a really basic and important <laughs> question um, that I, I thought I heard um, Principal Bates say that, you know, from his point of view, if you're not wearing a mask, then you don't come into school. Um, so I just want to make sure that there's 
agreement across the district on how that's going to be handled. I, I think that what we need to wait on right now is MASC because their policies are always run through legal counsel, which is why I'm asking for the support to move forward in this vein, but we will wait for the MESC policy that has been run through its legal counsel. And then we'll bring that forward for adoption by the, the school committee. So that's our process. Mary? So um, I, I would like to say what, um, what Joel Bates um, said, Amy, he said, um, that at this point, that um, going along with the with DESE guidelines, <clears throat> it was, you know, it was a grades three through up. Um, and so he was talking about those students, he was talking about um, discipline, et cetera. And he was talking about that age. He wasn't, he wasn't talking about everyone. And I, um, I'm very much in favor of masks. And I think that, you know, our governor, who has done such a good job in so many ways, and talking about consistency. So if, if all children um, who are over two in public have to wear masks, then why would it be different in schools? And I, <clears throat> I think about the fact um, that there might be, I th would think there'd be very few children, children with special needs who may not be able to, and maybe they'll come up with some, some other way. But mm -hmm. for the youngest students, these are the students who will not have pre preconceived notions that, <clears throat> that it's weird. And especially when they see um, older students and one of the you know, beauties of at least Florence or all the schools in a way, you have role models in the older students. All the older students will be wearing masks. <clears throat> and so what can happen um, preschool and, and kindergarten is um, I think of responsive classroom. They have something called guided discovery where they break down learning materials into exactly what the students would do and the, and the modeling and the practice of this. And this becomes empowering for them rather than a restriction. And again, they don't come with preconceived notions that only people from other countries wear masks. Um, other countries where they're doing a better job than we are in terms of COVID. Yeah, they do wear masks and we should too. So um, I, I think that we, we need to wait because other districts will be looking in terms of students who might not be able to wear a mask. And I think there'd be very few. Um, and if it's a tactile issue, I'm sure there'll be ways um, to maneuver around about this. I don't think we'll be seeing a large population, but if, if Brooke wants my, my opinion, my support, I'm in support of consistency and for all of our students, at least K, if not pre-K, and I would defer to Joan and other people who are specialists in pre-K. Um, okay. So we'll wear masks. Yeah, thank you. Um, but we're gonna get the policy from, Brooke is asking for a, essentially a universal support in the schools and we'll look at the policy. And once we get the policy, we can um, discuss it and, and, and vote on it. Um, I think we want to give a heads up right now that that's my thinking. So I'm, okay. I'm just no, it and that's fine. And I, we, we don't have another meeting planned right now, but when something comes up, instead of planning something right now, when there is something to meet about, we'll just send the word out and pick a date and, and, and get together. Um, if you have additional questions, please raise your hand so that I will call on you, but I'm going to create an order to call on people. Who else has questions? So um, Leah and Amy and who else? Okay, Leah. I just wonder on the policy front, so our policy subcommittee is gonna be meeting on Monday. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that is pressing in that regard, Brooke? There isn't anything pressing right now. Uh, Steve Colony and I have been having some discussion back and forth because we're, we're wondering if we might end up, a, we're not there right now, we're not there to bring something forward to you, but, but just know that it's out there right now that we are just waiting to see how his schedule works and to see if we need to make some changes. Uh, so we'll get, we'll connect with you if we, if we find ourselves in a position that we have to make a change. But right now, right now at this second, we don't, but we might. Okay. Um, Amy? Amy, do you have a question? I was wondering, Brooke, if you could offer any, just, uh, I know you may have addressed this in the community forums and 
Um, I find sometimes that I, um, I'm a better person when something's in writing. So I don't necessarily catch the full answer when, when there's a Zoom meeting like this. So I apologize if this has already been addressed. I'm wondering if you can give some more specific timelines on when parents can expect um, a timeline um, detail on when, uh, like the, the first day of school, I think that's a really important thing to share with parents as soon as possible so they can mm -hmm. the plans in case they miss that. Um, but, you know, you've mentioned that there is a booklet that I know you're all writing and rewriting and then something else will come and you're rewriting it. Um, when can parents expect to, to see that? So the, uh, so a couple of quick thoughts on that. First of all, um, what what we're generally referring to, we, there are two documents that are at play right now, and um, Todd could certainly speak to this. The one is one that he's just uh, putting final touches on right now that's going to the state on Friday. And that's not something that necessarily we would go out and touch base with with anyone on quite frankly because that's just us and, and and that was made abundantly clear even again today because we did ask the commissioners is this something that we need to run past school committee or anything no 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 not at all just submit it to us so that that's the end of that so that's over with so then the other thing that we're working on a parallel to this is the august 10th comprehensive plan and so we're all adding bits and pieces to to that particular plan and probably what you'll find that and that's due on August 10th to the state we have no idea when we will receive the approval or anything like that and keep in mind too that now we've got a little bit of extra time in terms because we've got the new start date of that September um, 16th date so there's a little bit of additional time there before students will come into play and so you're right that's really important for folks to know and then what we're doing and you'll see us probably pull bits and pieces out of that August 10th uh, the, the comprehensive plan that we're building that will ultimately find its way as as a type of booklet or a how-to, if you will, for our parents. And so that that's the document that we're we're working on that will, you know, I don't know that we'll necessarily um, have to submit the whole comprehensive plan to parents. However, I would tell you that we will be bringing bits and pieces of that to our school committee when we see that that's, a, that's a getting closer to being uh, prepared. So you can expect that we'll probably organized for another school committee meeting sometime in early August there uh, at some point in time just for the purpose of taking a look at that because we'll want your support as we move forward with that. But keep in mind that all of that work and all of that everything like that's where we're planning that's where we're heading but we don't know that that's where we're going to land. I can't say that enough times and that that's not because I think something's going to come up and dramatically change anything or that I've got any inside information because I don't. But I mean, I give you an example, you know, um, um, my, uh, and this is probably not a, you know, not a, the best example to use. However, it's an example, but when you take a look at what happened in Falmouth and Maynard, and you know, I, I know that uh, there's a, a soccer team that was practicing and, and playing and suddenly uh, one child was tested and this is in a community close to us. One child was tested positively for COVID. All the little soccer players of that team were tested and a group of them were po tested positively. We don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, I would love to put timelines and say, this is how it's going to work. But the truth is, and the commissioner said it today, I don't know, several times, we don't have control over this virus right now. None of us have control. And so, you know, as much as I would love to put the timelines and say, here's what you can expect. It makes me nervous, Amy, because things could change on a dime. And, it, you know, and it, Sharon, it kind of gets back to your point too. We are trying to put out the best information we have when we get it. And even at that, sometimes we worry, and this is the superintendents have said this so many times to the commissioner, you know, we put things out there and then we have to come back behind it and say, well, the guidance has changed now. It's not a good feeling for us. I mean, I'm just saying as a, as a leader in the district, it's not a good feeling for us when we have to come back and say, we have to change. So that's why I'm going forward and saying, we're moving forward with the hybrid, but we know that things could change on a dime. And the, with the recent cases of COVID, and I would say just within the last five days that I know about, 
it makes me incredibly concerned. So, uh, you know, you'll see us move forward with the August 10th comprehensive plan that will come before um, school committee at some point in time, just before we have to submit it. But you know what we're working on, you know what we're working towards. Um, and then, then the notion is, at that, right around that area, you'll probably see us come forward with something that we will send out to parents as well, hoping that we're still pushing forward with the hybrid plan at that point in time in 12 days or whatever it is, so. Okay, thank you. I, Amy. I do wanna just um, not miss an opportunity to say thank you for all of the, the work that everybody is doing to develop these plans um, in such a frustrating environment. Um, <laughs> yes, I, it's thank not you for going acknowledging unnoticed. that. <laughs> and and um, I, I'm not trying to um, make your life more difficult by asking these questions, but I think I'm just trying to um, express some of the frustration that um, as a parent, um, there is among the community with not knowing some of the the um not knowing how to plan their lives <laughs> i think that's so, really what it comes down so to. you can you take that to... that level of frustration and transfer it to our level yeah. and know how frustrating it is for us to be because this is not how this administrative team operates we are and so many of us on that administrative team are parents as well and are feeling the same exact the same thing. feeling on on both levels my kids are in another district One's going to middle school and one's going to high school. And that transition, I don't have half of the information we're giving out in this district, to be yeah. quite honest. I, yeah. So. I, I would say that that's, that's something I've received too, is a number of um, emails in the last week thanking, mm -hmm. an, and I mean a number, not just a handful, I mean a lot of emails thanking us for the amount of information. And actually the very thing uh, that Todd just mentioned is I'm in a teacher in another district and we haven't had anything like this. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that um, I think honestly, Amy, I feel really good about the work that we've done and the outreach that we've done. And so um, I'm, I'm getting very few negative, very, very few negatives in about the level of communication. I'm getting just the opposite right now. Thank you so much for hosting the community forums. I think they went a really long way to answering so many questions on people's minds. They went phenomenally well. And Elaine could teach a master class in <laughs> Zoom chat management. It was unbelievable. So thank you very much. Thanks, Amy. Thanks. That's, to, that's enough, guys. You don't have to mention that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. You're great, Elaine. We get it. Um, I want to bring this part of the agenda um, to closure. Um, if there are no objections and um, move to the consent agenda, Elaine. Uh, yep, I move to approve the consent agenda of July 29th, 2020, containing the warrants of July 30, 31st, 2020 and the meeting minutes of July 22nd, 2020. Can I have a second, please? I um, Brett is seconding. Okay, um, all in, oh, I gotta do the thing, uh, Brett. We have to vote. Want me to do it, Kath? Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Alita, do it. All right. And I want to thank Alita. Alita's on vacation. <laughs> and um, she is here to help us out. Um, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Alita. All right, ready? Yep. Dr. McCarthy? Yes. Mr. Horish? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Rubenstein? Yes. Ms. Federito? Yes. Mr. Eckel? Said yes. <laughs> Miss San Filippo? Yes. Miss Codian? Yes. Mr. Gleason? Yes. Mr. Collins? Yes. Ms. Posh? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't have anything to update. Our workshop right now is planned for Wednesday, August 26th. I think everybody can go except for Rich. I don't know if it's gonna be remote or in person. And um, I'm going to get together with Elaine at some point and um, put a plan together. Basically, we'll be reviewing our protocols, looking at the master calendar, perhaps making um, tweaks to the district improvement plan um, and talking about our goals. 
for the year. So uh, we'll have more of a plan in place for you. Brooke will um, uh, let me know if there's a need for additional meeting and I'll send something out to folks. And I will follow up with um, Dorothy Presser about um, the policy regarding masks. So um, if Mary, yes. Do, do we need to vote on the changes to the calendar? Uh, actually, I, it's funny you should say that because I just texted Anne Marie and said, Anne Marie, did, did, don't we need to vote on this? So, well, do we have a definitive? It, on, Mary. All right, excuse me. Is it definitive that those are the dates? Yes, the, the, the 16th is the date, and that's the date that the DESE said is the last date. Okay. So that has so to be. We have to vote that that will be the start of school for students mm -hmm. for the 2021. 20, okay. That's exactly correct. Thank you. All right. So I'll, we need, Mary? I'd like to make that motion. Oh, you go right ahead, Mary. All right. That, that we accept the calendar as starting on September 26th with the, the days previous prior to that as professional development for teachers. Okay. Wait, wait. Not, not, not September 26th. Wrong date. Yeah. Oh, so how do, how do you do it? It's, it's September 16th, not 26th. Yes. yes, thank you. September 16th. OK. So can I have a second to Mary? Second. Any discussion? Thank you, Steve. OK, seeing none. Alita, would you do the vote, please? You did such a good job the last time. Yes. Dr. McCarthy? Yes. Mr. Horish. Yes. Ms. Cohen. Yes. Mr. Rubenstein. Yes. Ms. Verderito. Yes. Mr. Echo. Rich. I think he's frozen. Oh, there oh, oh. goes. Okay. <laughs> Ms. San Filippo. Yes. Ms. Cody Ann. Yes. Mr. Gleason. Yes. Mr. Collins. Yes. Ms. Posh. Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. And thank you, Mary, for reminding us. And um, if there is nothing else, then I would like a motion to adjourn. So moved. And second? Second. Um, I think it was Amy that seconded. Leah. Okay. Alita. It was Leah. Oh, I'm sorry, Leah. <laughs> it's a good, it's it's a good thing we have Alita here. I'm telling you, she keeps us on the straight and narrow. I know. I mean, there's too many people to watch. Um, Alita, would you do the vote, please? All right, here we go. Dr. McCarthy. Yes. Mr. Horish. Yes. Ms. Cohen. Mr. Rubenstein. Yes. Ms. Frederito. Yes. Mr. Eckel. Yes. Ms. Sanfilippo. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Cody Ann. Yes. Mr. Gleason? Yes. Mr. Collins? Ms. Park? Yes. Thank you. And Hi we everybody. Are, thank you so much as a school committee putting in the extra time. The thank thoughtfulness, you. the effort is just tremendously helpful. And um, Brooke and your team, ditto. It's just, it's it's amazing. And um, I look forward to being able to bore my great grandchildren with stories of how I survived this pandemic on the school committee. So thank you for the memories. Um, all right, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Happy. See you tomorrow I, night. Yes. Bye.